a very warm welcome to another episode of e gurukul where our beloved teacher dr pc mahapatra he is going to continue with his uh, uh, sessions on various tips and tricks of surgery in gynecology and today's topic is hysteroscopic surgery so uh, dr uh, mahapatra uh, had been very energetic in transferring his skills uh, his energy is uh, you know uh, it motivates everyone so uh, without taking much of your time i, I would like to uh, give this uh, session uh, to dr mahapatra uh, so that we can learn lot more from him dr mahapatra please well thank you dr divan and the whole team of juventus for uh, uh, the continuation of the program of e gurukul amongst our fellow gynecologist and all that and uh, really a, a pleasure on my part to be associated with this program and i was stimulated by the viewers and the response and all my gynecologists across the country so that i'm continuing the program in the meantime we have almost finished 10 episodes it was a real surprise when i look back and 10 different types of focus aspect we have discussed and uh, i thought it's an end but uh, Juventus people didn't uh, uh, want to stop me, and that's why I'm really happy and really grateful to the Juventus whole of the Juventus team for their effort and spreading the knowledge and sharing the experiences of mine to my fellow gynecologists, my colleagues, my friends, my you know, students, my grand students, and all that. Uh, believe me, with um, humility, I can tell that yes. Um, we uh, learn from our mistake and surgery is a thing where you have to have uh, um, repeated uh, i think uh, procedures and uh, do it in a very meticulous way not only to prevent complications but to give a good result to the patient ultimately it boils down to result the greatest wealth of the professional i always tell is acquiring a skill and that is the main purpose for which the skill is required and uh, with uh, 38 and 40 years of experience uh, in this profession as a gynecologist i have done several mistakes and i will i will just convey and share my mistakes to other people and my methodology of treatment and experiences for the last uh, so many decades so that the newer generation will get uh, really boosted with this and do do more innovative work and they will excel Uh, the previous generation including myself and all that and with that purpose we are continuing this program of the surgical skill transfer and uh, i here uh, all welcome all the viewers of mine to this e gurukul program an innovative program of a teaching program and uh, episode 11 which is uh, mainly targeted for the surgical skill transfer and uh, solving the clinical dilemmas well this time i think again i pray lord for everything because beyond science something related to the super supreme is there which uh, we always uh, uh, respect and we always regards and we always pray well this time i thought the topic will be mastering hysteroscopy and mastering hysteroscopy the tips and tricks uh, i think i will just narrate within a couple of hours uh, and sharing my experiences with this well um, there is no doubt that endoscopy has infiltrated every branches of medicine including gynecology and gynecologists are in forefront in terms of the endoscopy and starting from the laparoscopy to hysteroscopy to colposcopy there are various various horizons of the scopy which has expanded its indications and the procedures and over few decades i think there is a lot of advances by the technological advancement by the improved skill of the gynecologist and finding out new opportunities a new arena in the field of gynecology in various places so that one can boast himself or herself as a true endoscopic gynec endoscopist when he or she will do everything it's not limited or confined to the laparoscopy or a particular segment of the laparoscopy or a particular surgical procedure only a gynecologist is not i always say that a gynecologist is not a complete gynecologist without the knowledge of endoscopy 
an obstetrician is not a complete obstetrician without the knowledge of sonography. I think these are the two hands of the obstetricians and gynecologists, which every gynecologist should master that. Unfortunately, hysteroscopy has not become very popular among the gynecologists because some of the people want that this is a very difficult procedure to learn. But believe me, it's a very easy procedure to learn. And I want all my gynecologists to be hysteroscopists. And there are various rewarding opportunities for hysteroscopy, both diagnostic as well as operative. Once you become really start the procedure, you're addicted to the procedure of the hysteroscopy for that. And again, I must say that the whole complete endoscopic procedures in gynecology, both hystero and lapro are complementary to each other. And uh, the tips and tricks has to be really born to prevent complications and maximizing the results, minimizing complications for that. Well, um, uh, the uh, what is hysteroscopy? Hysteroscopy is not a new thing. It is old, uh, 18th century, 19th century. I think there were a lot of advances. And this is just a visualization of the uterine cavity, hystero and scopy, to view, to view the interior of the uterus and visualization of the cavity of the uterus and cervix to some equipment. And this endoscopic equipment has helped a great extent in this uh, hysteroscopic procedure for that. There has been a lot, lot of advances since that beginning of this century. I think the evolution of hysteroscopy, when we look back, way back in 1805, this is the father of hysteroscopy, P. Bojini. Bojini was considered the father of hysteroscopy. Before laparoscopy was born, hysteroscopy was born. And for few decades and few one or two centuries, it was just dormant because of some obvious reasons for that. 1805, uh, Bojini was an extraordinary visionary. And uh, the curiosity is beyond, beyond human values and all that. So that's why he, due, due to the undue curiosity, he has a curiosity for exploring, for looking into the natural orifices, putting speculum into the natural orifices of the human being, and particularly the females. And for this act, the reward for undue curiosity is he has to spend in behind bars till many, many years, till the death he was being sentenced. And this is the this is the sequence of events, not only of Bajini, but any innovators over the globe. You find that innovations, innovators are put behind bars because some newer philosophy, somebody points out, I think they're all prone to the criticism and legal problem for that. After 50 years, Desert Max, as a urologist, he's come as a father of cystoscopy. He added how to improve this internal thing by putting into the speculum or by creating a new orifice. You have to find a light source. We cannot see in the dark and the region is not there. And he was credited in formulating, giving the light source, transmitting from the outside to the interior. And that is a revolution in the field of urology as well as the gynecology for that. In 1869, you see, 1869, Pantaleoni was the first man who introduced this hysteroscopy in endoscope into the prim primitive endoscope, into the uterine cavity of a 60 years postmenopausal lady suffering from polyp and credited with the removal of the polyp in a postmenopausal woman. And that's why he was considered as a father of operative hysteroscopy for that. And since that time, lot of innovations, lot of researchers, lot of endoscopic surgeons across the globe, starting from Nietzsche, Clado, Hopkins, and Palmer, and uh, modern stalwarts like Lindemann, Hamu, Neuwirth, Goldrath, Dicheni, Bagish, Sigler, Daniel, Magos, Vitochi, Osama, and uh, Dr. Professor Motasho from India. I think they are credited. They have spent a lot of time in the hysteroscopic procedure, not only in innovations, but for spreading the uh, knowledge of hysteroscopy into the gynecologist's mind. Well, what is the difficulty? The endoscopic examination of uterine cavity is difficult. If you compare with the laparoscopy, the space is such that you can, you can visualize the peritoneum, intraperitoneal contents by giving an hemoperitoneum, the margin, the wide, wide views can be done and it can be very well depicted by hip laparoscopy. But here the difficulty is, Number one, entrance through a narrow passage 
very narrow passage through the cervical canal, you have to introduce your scope. Second most important, because the uterus is a very muscular uterine cavity, distension becomes a problem. If you compare the distension of the bladder or urinary bladder by the urologist, or the distension by the laparoscopy uh, surgeon by the pneumoperitoneum, it's very easy, but difficulty in distension is there. And that for these regions, technical regions, uh, the advances of hysteroscopy falls behind laparoscopy. Another important, that the bleeding from fragile mucosa, the bleeding from fragile mucosa and obscures the vision for that. And many, many other technical problems like the vision, the camera, the light source, the clarity of the vision, the distending medium, all these created hysteroscopy in a back bench than the laparoscopy for that. Now, the advantage of hysteroscopic surgery are related to the patient, to the physician, and to the pair. I think the patient, there is a really a, a, a minimal invasive surgery, concept of minimal invasive surgery is really met with by hysteroscopic surgery than compared to the laparoscopic surgery. Even with the office procedure in the clinic, many of the procedures can be tackled in the daycare procedure and within hours patient can be discharged for that. And for the physician also, it's very simple procedure and they can learn and practice this. And for the pair, ultimately the hospitalization is not there for a long period and therefore the pair is also benefited for that. Now coming straight away to the indications of the hysteroscopy, broadly I will divide into the diagnostic as well as therapeutic. You just visualize the cavity to diagnose some of the intrauterine pathology. And then initially that stays for a long, long time. And subsequently with the innovations in the technology and the different accessories and advances in the vision and the distance and medium and working through the very small uterine cavity, I think the therapeutic armamentarium has been broadened and the scope of hysteroscopy has been really uh, very big nowadays for that. Indications are now following the hysteroscopist for that. Now, the common indication, common indication of hysteroscopy is an abnormal uterine bleeding. Gone are the days when a blind DNC was there for years together. Gynecologists were doing a blind DNC and endometrial pathology for that. And now we have reached a stage that the high resolution sonography can be an aid to the procedure for that. But uh, the real visualization, direct visualization of the uterine pathology cannot be compared with the other procedures, other methodology for that. <coughs> Therefore, nowadays, uh, for abnormal uterine bleeding, hysteroscopy is mandatory for that. Because many cases we find that uh, uh, presumed to be an endometrial hyperplasia presumed to be a normal uh, uterine uh, cavity and diagnosed as a dysfunctional uterine bleeding or AUB, which is uh, uh, related to the non-structural. Now, by hysteroscopy, you can find that this non-structural lesion can be a structural lesion. And diagnosis from abnormal uterine bleeding can be shifted. It's not a functional, but it's a really pathological thing. It either could be a small polyp, or a myoma can be detected inside the uterine cavity by direct visualization. Even in suspicious cases, you can do a directed biopsy. Even for hormonal, I think the, uh, the basis of the hormonal basis also, you can do a curatase after visualization of the cavity and send it for endometrial study for the pathology to exclude either a tuberculosis or malignancy or whether the type of endometrium, whether a proliferative, secretory, or hyperplastic endometrium, we can know that. And that's a positive correlation between histopathology and the diagnosed and the hysteroscopic appearance and correlations up to about 80, 90% of the cases. And uh, there are various procedures, operative procedures, which can be done through the hysteroscope, which is very, very rewarding. A polyp, a myoma, giving rise to bleeding, starting from the adolescent to the reproductive age group and postmenopausal. I think these are some of the rewarding surgeries in minimal invasive surgery. You can do it with the modern gadgets, ablation and resection. Endometrial ablation and resection. This, I think there is a lot of controversy and debate, which I will discuss in later, but still I can say that the concept of ablation and resection came from what? Say it's very, very, the concept is very, very genuine that 
why do an unnecessary hysterectomy when the endometrium is defective? Why do a, do a hysterectomy when the only endometrium is defecting with giving rise to bleeding, as for example, in dysfunctional uterine bleeding, in hormonal, in DOBO or DOBE? I think there is no, no, no need of removing the blind, innocent uterus and the cervix for that. Because if endometrium is defective, remove the endometrium. And that's the concept basing on ablation and resection for that. So this resection, hysteroscopic resection, has been really alternatives like thermal balloon ablation or some of the uh, the, Faradix, uh, the the other methods of uh, laser or radio frequency ablation has been adopted for that. But the resection, we have done a lot of resection procedures earlier. There are some some indications of resection, young age, abnormal uterine bleeding, not responding to medical management, patient is keen for conserving the uterus. I think resection uh, or ablation could be a better option for that. And But there are some, some of the debates or controversies relating to the resection. And there are therefore, it's not it's, uh, popular for some period of time, but somehow it was not very popular till date. And uh, this is also an option. I don't say that resection, you don't do it now. But the, subsequently, because of the debates and controversies, we have really, many people are stopped doing a resection and adopting some of the other methods like a, the balloon ablation and radio frequency ablation for that, which is a really a more non-invasive than this, uh, uh, the hysteroscopic research, because it needs a lot of uh, skill required for that. Now, second important group is uh, infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss. Recurrent pregnancy loss and infertility is one of the major things for hysteroscopic evaluation, both in terms of diagnosis as well as therapy. The intrauterine adhesions, if you look into that, the cavity, intrauterine adhesions, incomplete or complete, space occupying lesion, either a polyp or myoma, Congenital anomaly is starting from uniconvate to septum to various types of congenital anomaly of the uterus, proximal tubal block. I think these can be very well not only diagnosed, but therapeutic also, proximal tubal block, and particularly in assisted reproductive technology. If somebody is going for IVF, you have to see the cavity. I think it's a very costly or cumbersome affair. And we have seen many cases where without visualization of the cavity, without knowing the, what is the cavity, you do the procedure and then land in miscarriage because of the septum and other intrauterine pathology for that. And therefore, now it's a routine that before ART procedures or IVF procedures, a cavity evaluation is absolutely mandatory for that. Either you can do a three, um, the uh, high resolution sonography, the 3D scan, but hysteroscopy is more appropriate than the 3D scan. And phalloposcopy is another indication and a way forward and extension for the fertility management and fertility investigations for that. Now, the removal of foreign body again, removal of foreign body, IUCD, I remember the lost IUCD or missing thread, but it's inside the cavity. We are doing log back by the X-ray was the only method. And then subsequently came as a sonography, which can locate either whether it's a translocated or a displaced uh, IUCD for that. And for removal, I think our teachers and including me also have done many, many before the era of Scopy, we are doing a blind uh, methodology of blind curatives, dedilatation and curatives, and by feeling that there is a foreign body, we just scoop it. And in 50% of the cases, it is not being removed and is left behind and repeated procedure can give rise to more of complications like a perforation or Asserman syndrome or infection, bleeding, whatever is possible. But now within seconds, you do the procedure and put a hysteroscope and find out and just to bring down the IUCD, remove the IUCD if it's left behind. Ossified product, cannula tape, stent. Earlier, a lot of stent has been uh, usually given, particularly for microsurgical procedures in the tubal tubal anastomosis. No, now the uh, the indications are not very, very there. Stent people are not using it. Laparoscopic procedure is a better alternative without stent also. The cannulation, the recannulation can be performed. Now, sterilization. Many people have started looking for this sterilization as a method of sterilization. How to keep uh, 
But remember, the God has designed in such a manner the fallopian tube that it's better to block the tube from outside than to block it from inside. It's very difficult to block the tube from inside. And many of the chemicals or very mechanical blocks, including Assure, has been tried for that also. And Assure by hysteroscopy, you do a hysteroscopy and fix it with that block. It is being practiced for that, but it's not very popular and effective method of sterilization because uh, of the failure rate and all that, the failure are more. And be besides this, the miscellaneous, the photodynamic therapy and uh, other broadening of the spectrum of hysteroscopy, we are day by day, we are increasing the indications of hysteroscopy. Uh, and I will show you some of the videos which uh, I have experienced for the last so many years for that. Now, before going to that, let's uh, find out what are the prerequisites for hysteroscopic surgery. If you are going for a hysteroscopic surgery, and particularly the therapeutic, even diagnostic also, there are some prerequisites, the counseling. Everywhere now, the people are educated, they consult a Google doctor before coming to you, and the counseling, the proper counseling should be done. What for what purpose should be there? And it's a participatory practice. Patient uh, should know what is being done, and you explain that, that's very important. The tidbits of the hysteroscopic procedure should be done if you're doing a uh, office hysteroscopy, you must explain that office hysteroscopy without anesthesia will give it and with little sedations or analgesics or antispasmodics, the positioning is really, really an issue for that and many of the patients do not cooperate with that. So therefore, if office hysteroscopy has to be done, I think more of counseling is required for that. The patient should be convinced about the counseling part in the office hysteroscopy, which is now growing up and many centers are routinely doing the office hysteroscopy for that. As far as uh, my opinion is concerned, I'm, I'm uh, office hysteroscopy, I have some reservations for that because you find that office hysteroscopy diagnostic is all right, you can do it. And without uh, the speculum, you can do a vaginoscopic examination, a vaginoscopic and hysteroscopy. But the main problem is that about the cooperation of the patient, the positioning, they are very skeptical about that. And even uh, during the procedure of uh, IUA also, I've seen people are very, very, really women are very uncooperative for that. And therefore, this is one aspect. And some of the minor procedures, you can do it, not major procedures, we can do it. And if you are doing it, even books write that the operative room is much better. You practice from operative room. Then once you get that, then you can go for an office procedure. It's an adjunct to your procedure in some of the cases for that because the dilatation is really a problem. You may fail to dilate also. If the position itself is a concern and uh, there are many factors, patient factors are responsible, technical factors are responsible. And that's why this is uh, really revolves around some of the debate, but still uh, I think it's growing uh, that lot of uh, uh, advantage is there. They can go without uh, anesthesia. You can go away within a short period, go home in the office. But I consider there's an OPD procedure office hysteroscopy name has been given and uh, I feel personally that office hysteroscopy name is a marketing name for that. You are not an officer, doctor, medical officer and doctor has an OPD and OPD procedure, if you do an OPD hysteroscopy, it is not very popular. If you're doing an office hysteroscopy, I think it's a better terminology and gives some more of marketing and uh, uh, popularize the procedure for that. Also. It's my personal opinion. Now, pre-op evaluation, you must have to give an evaluation. Any procedure you do, the history, we cannot ignore our uh, the clinical scenario and a clinical sense for that. Whatever technology is being developed, the tech and touch both has to be blended for that. And pre of evaluation, it's a detailed history examination and the problem of the patient and supplemented with it and non-invasive investigations like sonography in all cases, in majority of the cases you do and what for you are doing, you must know that the purpose for which you are doing it and this sonography can give an additional value to your procedures for that. Also. So therefore, pre-op evaluation is important for that. Chiming. One of the many important things is your timing. In which period of the menstrual cycle you do the procedure? I think the post-menstrual period is the best timing for that because of the endometrium, because of the vascularity and because of the secretions. I think the timing is poor. Post-menstrual is the best period for that also. But even if the patient is bleeding, you can do with the bleeding procedure because 
you can do an inlet and outlet and wash and all that with the double channel seed, the clarity of the vision can be there if you're using the liquid medium for that. Endometrial preparation, if a hysteroscopic surgery, earlier we are doing a endometrial preparation, I think a, a course of uh, oral contraceptive or GNRA channel lock can be given for endometrial preparation. And this is most important people are favoring when we're doing a TCRE. The endometrial resection when you're doing it, the thicker endometrium is not able to resect and therefore endometrial preparation was more favored in those cases where they are planned for the resection procedure. Need for concomitant laparoscopy. I think if you are evaluating the case for uh, as an infertility, I think the concomitant diagnostic histro and laparoscopy are the best method for that. We can't say that yes, DHL uh, is the only thing which is done in the first resort in infertility. No, I don't say that in, there must be some indications for because still there is a minimal invasive surgery and uh, patient is infertile and within one year completed, young age, you don't have to do a hysterolaparoscopy for that. There are some indications for hysterolaparoscopy in for duration of infertility, age of the patient, treatment received, and some sonographic abnormality of some pathology, patient complaints of dysmenorrhea. You find that there is some problem in that next up. I think there's a laparoscopy has to be done in that particular case. So uh, otherwise, HSG is still a method for that. You can't have it's a supple com the uh, supplemental procedure, it's a complementary procedure. But believe me, concomitant laparoscopy gives a much better idea of the pelvis interior as well as exterior. I must say that an eye to the pelvis is far superior than two fingers in the vagina. And therefore, I feel that an eye to the pelvis by laparoscopy from above and hysteroscopy from below, I think that to give a clearer indication of the genital organs and related to the fertility potential for that also. In addition, when we are doing a surgery, concomitant laparoscopy in some of the cases is essential, particularly the cynica. The Asserman syndrome is one of the worst and the most difficult procedure in hysteroscopy. I say always in laparoscopy, fertility promoting surgery for endometriosis, advanced endometriosis, and the fertility promoting surgery in hysteroscopy for the cynechia, Asserman syndrome. These are the two very, very difficult skilled procedure for that also. And there you have to put a scope for that concomitant laparoscopy. In some cases of this septum resection, when we find that yes, you have to do a diagnostic laparoscopy before to say that it's not a bicornate uterus, it's a subsepted uterus, it is essential to do it. Although nowadays the 3D scan can give some of the ideas for that. But in initially when we are doing a TCRS to develop our skill to protect and prevent it, we put a scope laparoscopy to find out whether we have gone too far or not. And that will guide us by the light demonstrated through the hysteroscopy, then you stop it there for that. But nowadays with experience, I think it's not a mandatory procedure. Only thing is that you have to be confirmed that it is a uh, septic uterus, not a bicornate uterus for that. pre op cervical dilatation. We have a lot of experience prior to the prostaglandins, particularly the misoprostol. We were using uh, in difficult cases where there is a failure or uh, you're doing a hysteroscopic surgery where you anticipate in postmenopausal, in some cases where the difficult dilatation is there, you put uh, the cerviprin gel, intracervical gel, we put it. But the main demerits which I have found out that putting a gel, I think there is a distortion of the viewer, view vision in the cavity for that because the gel is inside, inside the uterine cavity that contents gives a very bad uh, vision unless you have to wash it with the outlet solution for a long time for that. And of course, misoprostol is a gift and boon to the hysteroscopic surgery uh, surgeon by as regards the cervical validation. In difficult cases, we do it. Now, the question comes, many people ask me whether in all hysteroscopy, in diagnostic as well as therapeutic, whether misoprostol can be given or not. I think you can, it's, an, it's a very important and a tricky question for that. You say that, yes, in all cases, it is. it may not be. So in case of multiparous, you go for an evaluation in the abnormal uterine bleeding where the os is open and you can easily dilate it and you can go for uh, the even have uh, the vaginoscopic examination. It's not necessary. But 
postmenopausal, previous failure, nulliparity. I think these are the cases. There is no harm in giving a misoprostol prior to the, the procedure for that also. So pre-op cervical dilatation, particularly the misoprostol is a boon. And uh, I feel that, yes, you can give it 200 milligram to 400 milligram of misoprostol, can be given a few hours before. Surgery. The only problem is that the patient will have a little pain and discomfort after the misoprostol insertion. But I feel that, yes, if you're going for a surgical, a therapeutic procedure with the dilatation, uh, larger dilatation, I think it's a, a, a really beneficial for that. Now, coming to the anesthesia part, selection of anesthesia, if you go for office hysteroscopy is all right. You can go for uh, sedation and all that, but I believe that majority of the uh, uh, hysteroscopic surgery can be is being done with the OT setup and there, the OT setup, the selection of anesthesia. For a short procedure, like a diagnostic procedure, the total intravenous, uh, I think pentothal or uh, propofol is almost a, uh, a procedure of choice for that. You can add to the LMA procedure for that. But as far as the major procedure or a therapy, hysteroscopic surgery, particularly if you're going for a myomary resection or for a bigger surgery where it takes a little longer time, and we have seen over the period of time that as regional anesthesia is much better than the general anesthesia. When we are using normally earlier, long back, we're using the glycine as a medium where uh, uh, you have to use a unipolar. Uh, nowadays, the bipolar resectoscope has come out where you're using the saline. And uh, for that, I think the toxicity, the best toxicity is ammonia toxicity and hyponatremia. And therefore, the cerebral symptoms can be better detected by the patient herself, and rather than uh, before the uh, the the fluid balance, you can find that this is the cutoff limit of the fluid balance of about 500 ml or 750 ml or 1000 ml. Before that, also the patient can tell that I am having some discomfort. This is the real advantage of regional anesthesia, where the patient can tell that I am feeling upset, and it can be diagnosed and predicted much earlier to the fluid deficit for that also. And therefore, in major surgery, I will always uh, advocate that, yes, this is a procedure when we go, unless you are going for a concomitant laparoscopic procedure. Otherwise, these are the uh, regional anesthesia has a place, particularly for hysteroscopic surgery and main so, but to particularly for myomectomy for that. Operating state of, I think, a good gadget-oriented surgery is important. In technological dependent surgery, I think the team is important for that. Team and tool are most important rather than a single surgeon for that. And therefore, this operating setup is very, very important. You have to check everything before going for a surgery or uh, the assistant and all that. That yes, before going for a proceeding for a surgery, I think this has to be done. And documentation. Nowadays, the endoscopic procedure is easy to document because everything is, can be recorded. The whole procedure can be recorded and all that. And that record is for your purpose, not for the patient purpose. Earlier, we have documenting and giving to the patient, and there's a lot of legal problem for that. But the documentation has given an opportunity to improve yourself. If uh, you know that these are the problem, or you can replay and find out what is the defect. I should have done this and correct yourself for that. Then apart from the academic interest for publication and all that, documentation is also very, very helpful for that. Now, one of the very important that you understand the, the tool, I think the instrumentation, very important. What are the instrumentation which is required? I'll devote a little more time for that in the instrumentation because this is important. Telescope, you need a telescope. In laparoscopy also, a telescope is required. In hysteroscopy, a telescope is required. And uh, the telescope is different from the uh, laparoscope. There are various types of telescope in a case of uh, hysteroscopy. It is either a rigid telescope, majority are using rigid telescope. There could be a flexible telescope, OPD procedure, office hysteroscopy, there are some flexible telescope is there also you can do. But uh, majority of the cases use the rigid telescope. Another is the telescope diameter. The diameter of the telescope, the four millimeter telescope is the conventional and usually used by majority of the gynecologists for that also. Now with the advances, with the vision, with the camera, I think the vision is improved with the improvised camera and their lesser diameter can be used for that also. A 2.9 millimeter telescope 
can be used and better visualization, same visualization can be done with that. And this is mandatory for office hysteroscopy for that. Smaller diameter of even 1.9, 2.9, 4 millimeter is there. And remember, either a zero degree or the 30 degree, four oblique, this is important. Now, zero degree can give a panoramic view and contact hysteroscopy is always a zero degree. Whereas panoramic hysteroscopy, you cannot see the ostea if there are oblique and therefore 30 degree is essential for that. Some people use 12 degree also and it can be done, but a little oblique view is necessary to visualize the ostea. And therefore, one of the very pre, uh, main uh, concern about the telescope in a case of hysteroscopy is that you have to have a uh, 30 degree four oblique and therefore you rotate on one side, you can see the other side of the ostium very well for that. Otherwise, you cannot see the ostium. And for contact microscopic, contact hysteroscopy, you apply the zero degree and uh, do the job for that also. But majority, we use four millimeter. Now, the advantage of lesser diameter of telescope is that you can do it in office procedure and with a small opening without dilatation also, with vaginoscopic examination, you can do it. But the major problem is the maintenance. It's more frequently uh, liable to be fragile and therefore be cautious about the use of when you're using this smaller diameter of 2.9 and all that. And uh, this is my personal experience also. And uh, because it's at uh, uh, my center, I used to have a training center for that. By this time, I have already broken uh, the uh, about uh, uh, four smaller telescope and two four millimeter and four 2.9 millimeter telescope for that also. And this is obvious. This is obvious. I can't blame anybody, but the maintenance is most important for that. And anybody using a lesser than four millimeter must be very, very careful about the telescope unless uh, he has an enough money. Uh, you cannot bother about money, then you spend it. Otherwise, this is a really a good uh, learning skill for that. Now, the second important aspect is that you need a seal because in laparoscopy, by putting a telescope, you can see the interior. But here, a seed is necessary because you have to put a distend the medium, distend the uterus by some distancing medium for that. And distending medium is very, very, I will just uh, spend a little time on the distending medium, either normal saline or uh, the high viscous medium or a low viscous with of electrolyte or without electrolyte, you can use it. And there are various methods of using that or you can use a gas medium. Basically, the medium are divided into the gas and liquid, which I will deal with the distending medium. But see, see these one millimeter extra than the, uh, the telescope because there should be a gap between the telescope and the, and the seed so that the fluid can come out. And if you're going for a double channel, seed can be a single channel or a double channel. There are single channel seed which is very important for OPD procedure and the small dimensions like 2.9 millimeter scope where a single channel can be done. Here the fluid will go through one, one channel and there is the return fluid will come out of the cervical opening, cervical canal, but it, the double channel gives a two, uh, although it is a wider diameter, diameter is increased, but the in, inside the inner channel, the fluid goes and the outer channel fluid comes along with the cervical leak so that the clarity is there, the wash is there inside. If there is a blood, if there is some uh, dirty material, I think uh, it can be very well washed and the vision is very good if you're using a double channel seed for that. So see, that I've just demonstrated again, what are the single channel and the double channel seed. Lighting, the lighting, same light source as the laparoscopy is done and genon is the best. It's a halide, halide halogen and genon. These are the three light source out of which the genon light source is the best light source because it gives a white light for that also. And now comes to the distending media. I've already told to distend the uterine cavity is a hell of that. And there is the distension of the cavity is essential for visualization and excessive distension is also fatal for the patient. It can cause complications for it. So optimum distension is important and there should be a system where the distension should be there, distending system, and distending media. The distending media are either a liquid or a gas. Gas carbon dioxide has been used earlier, but we are not using the, we are very comfortable with the normal saline. I will advise that normal saline is a very good media as a distending media for that. And normal saline, 
uh, is uh, uh, the uh, it could be normal saline it could be some of the uh, if you are doing a surgery if you are doing a surgery and using the monopolar current underwater monopolar current normal saline is conductive and therefore it cannot be used and therefore when monopolar underwater cautery was there monopolar by resectoscope was there for surgery then we use the other methods like uh, the glycine the sorbitol and the manitol these are the three media which is uh, electrolyte free and that can be used for that so the 1.5% 3% and 5% these are the respective thing for the glycine sorbitol and manitol and this can be used for that the clarity will be there and the surgery you can apply the current through that also but the main problem over the years we have seen about the toxicity many the fatality are due to the fluid the distending medium rather than the surgery itself and therefore the innovators have now many majority of the endohistoscopic surgeon has shifted from monopolar to bipolar resectoscope so for diagnostic distending media saline is all right for that also and therefore saline has been used as a distending media for all gynecological diagnostic procedure and for operative procedure saline with the bipolar resectoscope is much better or if it are using the caesar or with the grasper i think saline there is no problem in the saline stent so saline is the best form for that you accept that this is the best distending media only thing is that if you are a monopolar uh, resectoscope you cannot use the saline you have to shift to the glycine for that but glycine toxicity is really a concern for that now the distending system distending system varies from the gravity to the uh, medex pump pressure device or in plating the saline uh, by some mechanism by increasing the pressure to the endomat endomat is an electronically monitored device for control of the suction and irrigation that's all and endomat is nothing it controls the suction and irrigation and gives a pressure at a certain point for that also and the pressure intrauterine and pressure if it is above 70 to 80 mm mercury then only you can see the distension of the cavity it's visible otherwise before that before below 70 mm you can't see anything for that and in some cases when there is a leakage of the fluid through the cervical canal you are not able to know what was there in the instrument and what is the real in the intrauterine pressure for that so the visibility is important there is a lot of global difference between the pressure high pressure hystroscopist with the low pressure hystroscopist i don't name it but there is a lot of uh, uh, i think debate between this and i always say i am not in favor of high pressure or low pressure i am in favor of optimum pressure the visualization if it is not there the surgery cannot be done in a good way for that you cannot give a value to the surgery for that so basing on the intrauterine pressure remember that don't go for a prolonged high pressure for a longer time for that also there are many many it's not only the pressure the safety is limited to the duration of the surgery also to the whether you are using the current that's important and because we know that 70 mm and venous pressure is 4 mm so immediately the pressure will be there and it to be uh, in the circulatory system for that and believe me here i can say one thing that even you are using the normal saline don't think that is absolutely safe the thing of hyponatremia or ammonia toxicity like glycine will not happen but if you are going for a more of fluid more than 2500 ml at a time i think they go for a pulmonary edema acute pulmonary edema we have faced that and therefore don't say that yes only saline is safer you have to have a fluid deficit for that here the fluid deficit if you are going for a to more than 2 liters you are cautious about it but in glycine more than 500 ml ml deficit is really you are cautious about it so documentation of the fluid uh, is very very important the pressure for how long you are giving it an optimum pressure uh, beyond a certain limit i think if you are going for a lot of over distension that will cause a lot of problem uh, not only not from the surgery from the distending media and distending system for that. accessory instruments there are some accessory instruments like uh, the caesar uh, like a grasper like a morselator 
all these can be an accessory instruments and uh, uh, you can go for uh, if you are going for a cannulation you can go for a cannulation seat for that and of course the video imaging is a common uh, thing and all endoscopic procedure for that now a brief account of the uh, demonstration uh, the video of this we require two things mainly the external the if you are going for an operating room you require a sim speculum a helis and this is the dilator one specifically i will say that the dilator for hysteroscopy you are using it should be 0.5 apart it's not one apart so this is the form of dilator which is most suitable for hysteroscopy and the technique of dilatation is very very important that don't dilate and touch the fundus for that you have to just go beyond the internal loss then the second and it depends on which diagnostic needs a dilatation up to 7 8 and all the if you are going for a 6 uh, 4 to 5 you have to dilate for 6 7 and if you are going for a uh, surgical procedure you have to dilate up to about uh, the 11 12 now this is a then the telescope this is a telescope has got three parts one is an eye piece second is a barrel in the middle and third is the is the lens and this you remember that is not a zero degree this is a 4 mm and 4 mm telescope uh, or 2.59 mm telescope and put into the sieve this is a single channel sieve can you see that this is a single channel with only inlet is there and 2.9 mm telescope thin fine telescope is just inserted be very careful about it and alignment should be there in line with the uh, the three lines are there in the uh, here the, if you are using the single channel only two lines are required the the a uh, cable and the line should be in alignment and only one uh, inlet is there you can put it the normal saline into it for that so this is about the single channel telescope for that and uh, if you are using the 4 mm and this is a double channel can you see that on the left hand is the inside is the interior or inlet and the outside is outlet where there are fenestrated openings in the distal part for that and you can find that the proximal part closer to the closer to the eyepiece is the inlet and the outer part is the outlet we always say the fluid water falls from below and light from above so the you find out which is the inlet and which is the outlet and this double channel is much more preferable because the clarity of the vision is much more but you have to dilate a little and because the diameter is less and you cannot do it with the office procedure here an anesthesia short anesthesia is required for this and you see the uh, bevel age of about 30 degree four oblique to visualize the uh, the both the ostium for that also and uh, after assembling this you have to lock it so that it now it's this is the locking and unlocking in which uh, the same principle lies the line the two lines of inlet and outlet are in alliance with the uh, cable i think this uh, is the assembly and that assembly is very very important you must be very very delicate about this assembly and just see how the assembly is being done alignment and all that and then rotate it uh, rotate it uh, anti clockwise or clockwise to open or detach it and so that the set is ready for it and only thing is that you have to put the inlet and outlet channel and connect it to the um, endomat or a pressure device or and the cable light cable to the light source and the conventional camera the same camera which you can use it for that now second sit is this is a purely the two sits are diagnostic this is an operative sit this is an operative sit i think the caliber is not much as compared to the uh, resectoscope it is about uh, 5 mm up to 6 mm same 4 mm 4 mm uh, uh, telescope is being introduced into there are two channels into it and one is the inlet and one is the outlet can you see that and along with that there is an operative channel for that so it comes around 6 to 7 mm overall diameter and uh, you can see the assembly and this is the uh, the rubber uh, plug or rubber plug is there which blocks it and you can introduce the uh, you can introduce the piston is there the rubber piston is there and you can introduce your accessory instruments like this this is an accessory instrument of uh, the semi flexible uh, metallic instrument but semi flexible you can introduce it through that uh, rubber sleeve or the clipper uh, 
the nipple. This is called a rubber nipple. And you can see that how there is a space in between along with the inlet and outlet for that. And you can do some of the minor procedures like a biopsy. You can do it and the polyp removal, biopsy, many things. And this is a scissor where you can use it and cut the adhesions or uh, even septum, thin septum, you can cut it. Or you can introduce this is a common thing, hysteroscopic cannulation, proximal tube cannulation, the cannulation catheter. You can see that cannulation catheter, either a Cook's or Indianized catheter, uh, the catheter can be used. This catheter contains mainly the two parts outside with the stellate. With the stellate, it can be used. And after removing the stellate, you introduce a Teflon uh, catheter, which goes uh, and negotiate with the under vision to the tube and all that. So this is uh, important. Now, the third important uh, is a surgical procedure hysteroscopy. Surgery is the resectoscope. This resectoscope, I have already told, either a bipolar resectoscope or a unipolar resectoscope. It has a working element, and this working element is loaded with the, either a loop or a collins, which are, or a ball, whichever. If you're going for an ablation, ball is important. If you're going for a resection of myoma or endometrium, you need a loop. And if you're going for a septum resection, uh, you need a Collins knife for that. So this is the assembly of the working element with the two seats, inlet and outlet, with the two channels. And along with that, the working element, the, uh, the loop is being used and the cutting is done by the current. So the bipolar, or nowadays we are using the bipolar, the cable, the cable has to be inserted to fit it with that, and that is connected to the uh, electrosurgical unit for that. So this is how, this is a working element, and you see the loop, and loop, and the Collins knife. And you see the difference between the unipolar, all bipolar resectoscope and bipolar accessories are completely different from unipolar. And therefore, you cannot interchange that. And this has a bipolar loop is completely different from a unipolar. And this is a bipolar loop. Can you find that this is a, uh, the design is such that is uh, along with the loop, there is another metal behind it. And this is a Collins knife, which can be inserted uh, into the working element. This is how you insert the working element with that. And there is a slot and you can go and directly there are two prongs and the two prongs the unipolar, you got one prong, you got the two prongs which can be inserted and touched to the cable. And therefore, after inserting that, then the two different seats, inlet and outlet, and a silicon uh, tip is there to protect it uh, from operating and the current is flowing through that and that silicon is very, very safety for that. And this is how, this is the cable which has to be uh, you connected to that. And there is a slot in the cable in the resectoscope where you fit it. And this is how it is being fitted. And then the wire has to be collected to the electrosurgical unit to the underwater cautery. And this is a bipolar, the brightest example of bipolar. We're using the normal saline. And this set is same as the resectoscope of the urologist. The urological resectoscope and the gynecological resectoscope, the equipment are all same. When it is kept in the gynecologist office, then it is called a hysteroscope. And when it is in the urologist office, it is a urological resectoscope for that. That is the same difference. Maybe that the price is same, or it depends on the bargaining capacity of the urologist has got more of bargaining capacity, though they can get a lesser price for that. Now, coming to the distancing system, the HAMU is the founder and HAMU is the leader in formulating this endomat. And this endomat is an electronically devised equipment for suction irrigation. You see in the extreme right, I find a bar from 0 to point, point 0 to point 0.8, and you can increase or decrease by the marking. And when you do not want a suction, you keep it at a minimum of, of 0 or point 0.1. And if you want more of suction, if there is a uh, clearance of the fluid and vision, you can increase or decrease. The middle one is the, the millimeter of mercury, and that has to be set at a particular level or a critical level of around 80 millimeter. Or in some cases, when there is a more of leakage, you can increase it. If the vision is not there, more of leakage is there. You can increase it up to 100, 150 millimeter mercury. There's no harm for that also. And in the extreme left is the ML, fluid ML per, per minute. And that is up to about 500 ML uh, per minute. And normally 200 and 300 ML is enough for that. And this is how the connection is there. 
and you can connect it and the endomat on, on and you can connect it with that. Second important, these endomat costs very, um, uh, the company people are charging every year, they are increasing the, uh, the price for that, but it is safe for that. Now, in uh, if you do not have an endomat, this could be an alternative, but this is not an ultimate solution for that. Endomat, before endomat also, we are using the Medex pump. We're rolling the pump, Medex pump, a cover over the normal saline, plastic normal saline, and with or without a manometer and increasing the pressure by the um, cuff. Now this pressure, normally if you compare, much better is this type, without a manometer, without earlier we're using the Maddox pump, the cheaper Indianized indigenous variety and spend 30 rupees and get it the endomat and the pressure device for that. This is just a, just a tubing connected to the needle and the needle is above, put puncture the needle above the water level, above the saline level and increase the pressure inside the bottle so that even if you are using the 500 ml, you can do three hist diagnostic hysteroscopy pressure with 500 ml also. Till the last drop, the pressure is maintained. That is the main advantage of that in comparison to the Medex, where after 100 or 200 ml, pressure diminishes for that. And this is the electrosurgical device. We should have the monopolar separate, bipolar separate. This is because we are using the underwater cautery. And underwater cautery is the cautery which flows inside the water of normal saline, bipolar or unipolar. If you are using then glycine, glycine is a must because the, the conduction uh, is a major factor for that. So these are some of the pressure distancing system and the distancing media which can be used for that. And that uh, is very, very important for that. Now this is a, a, after assembly, I'm just showing it that the tube inlet and outlet just difference, water from below and what and light from above. And uh, the nearer to the cable is the inlet. But at times there is a practical difficulties of difference, where is the inlet and where. And that's why I will recommend you that the inlet, I put another another tubing. So inlet tubing is different than the outlet tubing. So it's a really, uh, the inlet tubing, you can know that inlet is a larger bore and you can uh, do that. And because you can fit it the two things in a different manner, to dissimilar things so that inlet and outlet can be diagnosed for that. So this is how you combine and procedure start with that. Now this is a flexible histofibroscopy where uh, in some cases in OPD procedure, this can be used for that. And particularly when the dilatation is a real problem, the flexible histofibroscopy is being used, but it's not very commonly used by gynecologists for that. And this is a set of uh, the, in the cart you can keep all the endoscopic gadgets. You have to require a vision light source. You have to have a good camera with the monitor and uh, the electrosurgical unit. The position is again like a lithotomy position. The position is really important as the gynecologist sit behind and good uh, position is there to safety of the patient, not to have a parallel, the neurological damage because of course the hysteroscopic procedure is a very short procedure. Normally in comparison to the laparoscopy, it doesn't happen, but this is a normal position for the hysteroscopic uh, procedures. Now coming to the hysteroscopic procedures, uh, I will just share some of my surgical videos where uh, you can know the different procedures. I will just start next. Now this is a case, a diagnostic hysteroscopy. Normal cavity, this is a case of normal cavity. You put a scope and this is a normal saline and with a 30 degree, you rotate on the left, left side, see the right ostium. Rotate on the right side, see the left ostium. And the surface, you can see very clearly. And then while withdrawing, you can see the endocervical canal. It hardly takes 30 seconds for completion of the procedure and get a lot of information for that. This is a case where you find, what you find here, I purposefully I showed here to find and I ask my students, what is this? They say that is a tuberculosis. It's not a tuberculosis, mind it. It's a gland opening. These are all normal hysteroscopic finding in a cavity in a surface. And because of the high resolution camera of uh, the HD, we see that the gland opening, these are all gland openings. I've seen many cases where after this, they give an anti-tubercular. Be cautious, these are all gland opening. It's not a tuberculosis. And uh, this is again a normal cavity which you find in hysteroscopy for that. But all ostia, both ostia, both the anterior, posterior and lateral wall, you have to see for that. And this is a 
combined procedure of diagnostic hysteroscopy and laparoscopy, which you do in an infertility, and you find a laparoscopy also absolutely normal finding for that. And you see the uterus, you see the ovary, you see the tubes, you see the omentum and other things. No evidence of tuberculosis is there, absolutely normal for that. So, and don't confuse with this tuberculosis with that and uh, have a good clear vision. And therefore, this is a procedure of diagnostic histolaparoscopy as a in minimal invasive procedure for infertility evaluation for that. And now, uh, after that, you put a dye and find the chromopertuation and either side, uh, they see that the dye is coming from both sides, uh, absolutely normal. And now, after the seeing the dye, the gynecologist become very happy that yes, uh, now my patient will conceive and pray God and all that. And the, but the major thing is that a combined procedure awards a, a, a lot of uh, other difficulties and therefore gives a more information than what it does the, the, what the previous thing uh, we do it. Now, this is a thing which I want to show you. Now, this is again a case where uh, you find that uh, um, this is a case of endometriosis. Can you diagnose adenomyosis? Can you diagnose, can you think and can you suspect endometriosis? Yes. One of the pointer is that both the ostia are pointing backwards. If you find that it is not lateral and both the ostia are pointing backwards, that means it is a fixed retroversion. And this is a case where you find that there is some adhesions and therefore you suspect that this could be endometriosis. Confirmation by laparoscopy, but hysteroscopically you can suspect that. Another hysteroscopic pointer in a case of adenomyosis is that you find a longitudinal regis. This is our observation over years that there are longitudinal regis in the fundus. You can find in the fundus, you can find the longitudinal regis. When there is a longitudinal regis and uh, the, both the ostea are backwards and backwards pointing and these are the cases pelvic endometriosis and with adenomyosis. So the longitudinal regis is in favor of adenomyosis pointing backwards is in favor of pelvic endometriosis for that. Now you find another irregular surface and uh, you find uh, the surface, you look at the surface. Now the ostium is all right, you're going through the cavity and uh, now you can rotate it and both the ostia can be visualized. You can see the water bubble and uh, just finding that the bubble is going through the ostia is not sufficient to say that the tubes are patent. It could be one of the possibility, but it is not a confirmed procedure for that. But you see that the both ostia is there and see the surface, most important is the surface. Can you see the surface? It's irregular and sonography reveals there is a thickened endometrial hyperplastic and these are all like a paddy field in summer, in hot summer, the paddy field. And these are classical and positive correlation with either excessive progesterone use or hyperplastic endometrium. Could be simple hyperplasia, could be complex hyperplasia with or without a TPF for that. And looking at the cavity, one can uh, really correlate and find out that this is certainly not normal because we have seen the earlier view that it's absolutely smooth and uh, uh, the smoothness of the surface is not there with that. And there are, therefore it's a, a most probably hyperplastic endometrium and a positive correlation is there for that. Now, this is a case of postmenopausal bleeding. And remember in all abnormal uterine bleeding in postmenopausal in particular, the gun the days of uh, the uh, biopsy from different quadrants and all that, fractional curatives, we were students, we were reading. Now put a telescope, put a hysteroscope and find out the cavity. You can see the suspicious areas and some of the abnormal polypoid growth and you take a biopsy, directed biopsy and find out the level, whether it's above the cervix, cervical canal or below it, it is enclosed. You can know it and stage the disease for that also. Now this is another case where we find that, yes, absolutely the, the visualization of the cavity is not very clear and there are whitish flecks and there are whitish flecks there on the endometrium. And along with that, you find that there is, a, there is an adhesion, there is a synical band, you can find it. This is particularly suspicious of tuberculosis. And these are the cases you do a histopathology to confirm it for tuberculosis. But hysteroscopic have a very good correlation if, correlation with the tuberculosis. If you find 
this type of epithelial endometrium or surface irregularity with uh, synechia, I think these are some of the, along with that, there are tubercles very fine. You can differentiate this from the gland opening for that. And this is classically the tubercular endometrium, which is correlated with that. There's another case, a case, uh, uh, a very young age, uh, uh, middle-aged, of course, about 32, 33, Paris lady, but uh, the bleeding continues, irrespective of the medical management and all that. I found that, yes, uh, putting a scope, uh, the ultrasound is normal. Diagnostic hysteroscope revealed the vascular endometrium. Can you see the vascularity of the endometrium? And this vascular endometrium could be a vascular cause for that. And therefore, this could be one of the causes, a vascular cause of abnormal uterine bleeding, which can be undetermined. And therefore, the palm coin N, N could be there, either a AV malformation or undetermined cause for that vascular cause could be there attributed to the pathology for that. So if you devote more time and see with the high resolution uh, camera, everything can be de depicted very well for that. Now, this is how we do a vaginoscopic approach. We say that, yes, <laughs> office procedure, we do that. And uh, we are not uh, putting any speculum, neither catching the uh, tenaculum. You just do a vaginoscopic examination, put a distance and media with a 2.9 millimeter and close the vulva, ask your assistant to close the vulva a little, so that little distance. And the fluid will guide you the point where there is a cervical opening, the ectosorvix, the endosorva internal os, then you enter into the, into the cavity. And this is a very, very important thing, office hysteroscopy, and you can do uh, a good job with that. And this is a vaginoscopic approach. You don't uh, have to catch the fundus, catch the cervix for that also, and see the ostia, and either side and it's made. And this is very much preferable and it can prevent the perforation. And this is an alternative. If you're uh, going for a dilator, it's avoided. And therefore, the perforation chance is much less in this particular case, unless you perforate with the telescope for that. This is again a cavity which is an abnormal cavity. It is a tubular cavity with only one ostium which is being seen. And this is a uh, with one ostium, this is a case of, uh, you can see all around and find out that this is a, a uniconvit uterus and you can confirm it by doing a laparoscopy, concomitant laparoscopy and confirm the uh, Mullerian abnormality. And uh, this is uh, just an evaluation for a case of a recurrent pregnancy loss. And the obvious cause is a, a tubular cavity or the uniconvit uterus for that. Now, this is a case uh, where you put a telescope, where you put a hysteroscopic, and hysteroscopic view came as a, uh, a solitary polyp. Uh, with the conventional hysteroscopy with a small polyp, one may not be able to diagnose that. That can confuse with hyperplasia. But uh, I think only thing is that saline infusion, so contrast sonography can detect and suspect this. But this is a direct visualization, which is 100% correct for that. Uh, this is a case again, a postmenopausal uh, lady. Again, you can see the surface is all right everywhere, it is normal. And there is a polyp uh, arising from the uh, left uh, uh, lateral, post lateral aspect and near the cornu, near the ostium, below the ostium. And uh, the histopathology can confirm that this is a case, but this polyp needs an evaluation. You do a polypectomy and send it and for histopathologic examination for that. And here is again a postmenopausal women presenting with uh, this uh, suspicious of endometrial good resolution sonography can, can give an evidence of uh, the endometrial polyp for that. And you find the whole cavity is filled with the polyp. And it's a vascular polyp and histopathology can be confirmatory, but you remove the polyp. If the polyp, after removal, hysteroscopic removal, polyp, the whole cavity is normal and uh, uh, if the pathology came, histopathology came as a benign, you can leave it as such, you know, so just a follow up for that and patient will be absolutely all right for that. And majority of the so-called postmenopausal bleeding are either a functional abnormal uterine bleeding and or this, uh, a case of polyp. These are the cases and very few cases when we hysteroscopically find that it's a suspicious of malignancy, then we go for uh, the subsequent management. Otherwise, just removal of that polyp is enough for that. 
this again varieties of polyp you can find varieties and patients and uh, different this is again a polyp it is a really a petal shaped polyp it's like a flower it's like a flower the solitary polyp remember the polyp whether you find a solitary polyp or a polypoidal endometrium these are completely different a solitary polyp needs a treatment because this gives rise to uh, either a repro the pregnancy loss or infertility for polypoidal endometrium when you find it is a hormonal disturbance and uh, hyperestrogenic state and these are the cases which requires a medical management for that also and uh, this polyp must be very well uh, tackled with the hysteroscopy procedure for that this is another a polyp you find that everything is there but the ostium near the ostium there is a polyp and in unexplained infertility this could be one of the cause but unlikely this polyp could be preventing this sperm entering i don't i have a doubt for that but still in unexplained infertility i have some experience that you just remove it catch it up with the um, the forceps and uh, uh, just remove it you can twist it with the hysteroscopic uh, forceps and then remove it and that becomes a so this is one example where i can give you show you that osteal polyp can be a cause of fertility infertility for that and bilateral this uh, this is good it cannot be a mechanical but somehow it could be contributed for that also now you see this is a case where in contrast to the solitary polyp this is uh, everywhere is a irregular surface polypoid endometrium all these are majority of the case can you see this and these are all abnormal uterine bleeding supplemented with the long term progestogens and this excess progesterone activity can give rise to better biopsy is absolutely necessary when you look at the hysteroscopic view that biopsy is absolutely necessary for that but believe me if you compare with the blind dilatation curates and look at this in this generation and when we are practicing science uh, with the rationality i think this is nothing this is very very important that scientifical you get satisfied that these are the cases when we do hysteroscopy supplemented with the blind dnc you are satisfied that you are doing a good job for that now coming to the operative procedure this is a solitary polyp and the patient uh, uh, presented with uh, two previous losses along with menorrhagic cycle and uh, the uh, uh, the sonography reveals that there is a thick endometrium thick an endometrium about 18 mm but on putting a Uh, uh hysteroscopy you find that and here the polyp is being moved i uh, push the um uh, the, the the roller i think uh, the loop the cutting loop and you can find the difference between this and myoma is completely different you see the texture of this after cutting it it's absolutely looking at that uh, texture it's a soft and you can see the, this is a polyp it's not a myoma myoma can resection you can find clearly the muscular tissue and fibroid and uh, this is a typically a, a case of a solitary polyp which needs treatment for that also either infertility or a pregnancy loss or even abnormal uterine bleeding patient is fertile patient is having babies but uh, abnormal uterine bleeding and young age 30 35 and don't do a hysterectomy here just polypectomy is enough for that also and believe me these are all bipolar so within a short time try to uh, finish it as quickly as possible maintain the fluid balance and uh, the all the myoma or a polyp is very easy according to the location when you find that absolutely the base is clear and uh, on completion of the procedure you can be a certain that i have done a good job for that and uh, in posterior or a lateral situation it's much easier than the anterior or fundal believe me if it is a fundal or interior it's a difficult than the the posterior it's again a lateral wall arising from the right lateral wall again a vascular polyp you just uh, uh, either you can use the same thing by the uh, um, by the loop and remember when there is a vascular polyp you just coagulate at the base and then resect it so that it will much better for that or you can do by caesar also you can cut it by caesar but remember that there could be bleeding and or you can grasp it and just rotate it twist it and with the uh, your uh, forceps your uh, the hysteroscopic forceps you just you can hold the uh, pedicle at the base and just twist it 
and it will be come out for that. And this doesn't require any electrosurgical equipment for that also. Like this, you can hold the uh, base and just twist it. And by twisting, it uh, just like a myomatous polyp, cervical polyp, it can twist it and it will be out for that. Is another method apart from not using the uh, electrosurgical equipment, we can remove the poly for that. Even with the uh, your own uh, telescope and the resect, uh, the uh, diagnostic seed also, you can just push it and clear the procedure. Now it's completely out. And this is another method by which a small polyp can be removed for that. Bigger polyp is very difficult. It's saying you have to use it for that. Now this is again a bigger polyp and a vascular polyp. You have to just coagulate that on the base. This is a vessel which is there, coagulate that from the base so that the, uh, the vessels can be coagulated, the bleeding will be less. And then you can find that, yes, uh, do the job complete, resection of the polyp with the loop and applying the uh, uh, electrosurgical equipment. And this is how the resectoscope, the bipolar resectoscope, I have already shown you that resectoscope, I'm using it, is complete, almost filling two thirds of the cavity. When you distend it, you can be found but once it is a, you cannot uh, remove it uh, by just removing at the base because by piece by piece, if you can remove it, the removal is much better. They completely, you can see, and uh, the whole tissue can be sent for histopathological examination also. So this is how a polyp, solitary polyp, uh, you can resect it by uh, the hysteroscopy for that. Now, this is another case again, uh, you go and see what is there inside a case of abnormal uterine bleeding and uh, young age 32, 33 years. And you can see again, this is a polyp and see the texture that it's not a case of myoma. The tissue texture will reveal uh, that it's a case of uh, endometrial polyp and a solitary polyp. And these are maybe a cause of infertility, maybe a cause of reproductive pregnancy, pregnancy recurrent pregnancy loss or commonly uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. And if you keep the uterus, you don't have to remove the uterus uh, in this particular individual and uh, do a good job by just 10, 15 minutes procedure by the bipolar resectoscope. You can complete the procedure for that. You can see how under vision, you can do complete resection and up till base, you can go it for that and uh, finish the procedure and discharge the patient next day or in the evening, you can discharge within hours, patient will be absolutely normal and uh, that is the procedure. Then this is the base for which you can go for that. But remember this, when you are using the polyp or myoma, the procedure is you go beyond that and just have a passive, not have an active. So in the, there's a difference that you movement of the uh, telescope, movement of the working element should be from above below. And you can see that from above below, this is the remnant part with the there. But initially I've gone from below because I've coagulated the vessels in the uh, pedicle, in the base. And now we find that this is the complete procedure. All of the polyp is removed. You can see the base and clear that. If there's a bleeding, you can apply the uh, coagulation and active bleeders can be easily. And this is a cutting current, which uh, say, and coagulation current, if there is an active bleeding, you can do that and send the specimen for biopsy for that. Now, this is another case. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, these are the cases where, again, another uh, uh, thing uh, where you find that, yes, uh, there is a polyp. You can see that there is a polyp, endometrial polyp. And you can see that there is a septum also. And, uh, and now I find that after going to the septum and one, one ostia, closer to the ostia, there is another submucous myoma. So there is a four in one. Is a four in one in case where there's a very unlucky patient and a lucky surgeon. That one case you have four in one: one septum, one polyp, and one uh, uh, the myoma. And along with that, the tubal block is there, and you do uh, the cannulation for that. Now next is about the septum. One of the most rewarding surgery in hysteroscopy is the septum. But you have to select the septum. Indication of the septum. It's not primarily infertility, but a recurrent pregnancy loss. But in some cases, when you find the septum, in a case of infertility also, you need to operate. Because in cases when there's a long septum or the patient is going for some assisted reproductive technology or in unexplained, you have done all investigations, you have tried a lot 
and th and then think that most probably the implantation is on the fibrous septum that is the only indication for doing a septoplastic product so pre op evaluation uh, i have already told you ss and indication must be very genuine the techniques is that either with the caesar or with the laser or with the versa point or with the resectoscope so resectoscope is commonly being used and i personally use the resectoscope in majority of these unless it is a very thin septum we use the caesar otherwise caesar a thick septum is very difficult to cut it only you can cut uh, up till the endometrium not beyond that further and there will be bleeding and this electro surgical device using the bipolar device you can do a good job the bleeding is less and you can control it with exactly 90 degree and uh, the same line you can do that and uh, the only thing is that the completeness the common question raised that when can you know that it is complete i think this is a case where there are multiple things has to be done for that so once you see the both the ostia in the same plane i think it's uh, one point in favor of that and uh, second point is that when the muscular pinkish surface comes and uh, that is the end point when the bleeders are more that is the end point for that and you can guess it before uh, doing an mri you can do a 3d scan and find out the muscle otherwise you overcut it so always you undercut in a big septum you undercut and rather than the overcut and doing a perforation for that also in that initially we are doing a laparoscopic evaluation for that and uh, remember a laparoscopy is must to find out it's a broad fundus but at times we find there is a indentation in the fundus if there is an indentation in the fundus in the central part don't cut it much in the lateral part you do it but if the dome is there from the laparoscopy dome of fundus is there you can go ahead and cut it and remember that the optimum cut has to be done for prevention preservation not affecting the uterine muscle for weakness for subsequent rupture for that also so these are some of the steps has to be taken for septoplasty when you are using the current for that and complications post op care i will just narrate when i will deal with the complication for that is again uh, uh, septum this is another septum giving example of a diagnostic you can see the by laparoscopic view the completely this signifies the union between the two halves of the mullerian system the the line is being evident for that and inside you can find that there is just an arcuate it's just an arcuate and uh, it is less than 1 uh, cm by the 3d scan and therefore don't need a surgery for that it doesn't require any surgery for that and uh, this is another case where you find a cavity where you find a cavity and this cavity when you find that the right ostium is at a deeper level than the left ostium it's not at a same place can you see the left ostium and the right ostium there is a septum but asymmetric septum so these are the cases of asymmetric septum where there is a pregnancy loss and you have to very careful on the septal uh, resection for that so you have to resect on the right side more than the left side so that you balance it so this is some individual difference asymmetric septum for that this is uh, again a case of recurrent pregnancy loss <coughs> and you find a small subseptum and it is a one fourth and one fourth of the cavity uh, this subseptum suppose it would have been an infertility surgery is not indicated for that but because there is a previous uh, history of pregnancy loss or the patient is going for ivf even one fourth septum must be excised for that and remember the about the same point what is the limit of this looking at the both the ostia the vascularity the color pink or white that did determine the end point for septum resection for that this again there are various varieties human beings are such that individual there are some difference in that and here you find the ostium is there one ostium the other ostium is there on the other side and in between there is a in between there is a thin septum and in between there is a thin septum the ostium is there and so this uh, this can be really cut with the caesar also or with the uh, resectoscope just make it and is very easy to do this uh, uh, septoplasty for that and uh, when there is a thicker septum there is a need for removal of the muscle tissue along with that so after doing a septoplasty uh, you do 
uh, use the uh, the loop for removal of the redundant portion of the the uh, tissue. Otherwise, majority of the fibrous tissue will retract, and in majority of the cases, it's not necessary to do the uh, resection for that. Otherwise, this is a procedure which is very very important. Now you find in this particular case, the initially the most distal part is very thin, but as you go more towards the fundus, it is thicker and thicker for that. So it's like a, a really a bevel edge, and therefore uh, the uh, distal part is more thicker than the proximal part. And thicker part is better managed by current rather than by the seizure for that. This is my personal experience for that. This is again a case where a hysteroscopy is being done and you can find a long septum starting from the cervix. It's right from the mid part of the cervix, the just beyond the external os, you find that then there is a laparoscopy, there is a broad fundus, you see for the, uh, the patency and start it. The difficulty of this hysteroscopy, in the beginning there is a difficulty of negotiating and once you find that these are the, it's at the lowest level, you just go it and once you find it out and it becomes very easy within minutes, you can fill the job for that. But long septum, particularly in the cervix, gives a really problem in the initial phase of introduction of uh, your resectoscope and the channel and uh, the procedure is little uh, tricky. And therefore, you just initial, after the initial difficulty, you can complete the procedure with that. And anybody uh, within minutes, there's a very good high hand, eye and foot control. That's important in hysteroscopic surgery. A good high eye hand coordination with the foot is essential and for the, uh, the good piece of job and the good uh, uh, surgery for that. So there's the same thing happens. The limit of surgery you decide and uh, better you do it uh, undercut rather than overcut. You can do it and check hysteroscopy and then complete the procedure in between. Then creating problem of uh, thinning the muscle part in the uh, fundus in the central part, giving rise to the weakness in the subsequent pregnancy for that. So this is one aspect where you must take that you don't perforate it and keep uh, the muscle optimum for the uh, sustenance of the pregnancy in order to uh, not to have a silent rupture during the time of pregnancy for that. So on either side in the midline, you just cut it, you can control it if you are using electrosurgical device, you cannot control it by other methods for that. And therefore, it is much, uh, much more better. And now the cavity, a, you, a good cavity is formed for the pregnancy to continue for that. This is another case where the patient, a young patient, uh, uh, unmarried, endometri uh, the adolescent girl came to me and uh, she was having terrible uh, dysmenorrhea, not relieved with any pain. On sonography, we find an uh, anechoic area in the uterus itself. Anechoic area in the uterus could be either adenomyosis uh, giving rise to this, or it could be a, a, a non-communicating horn. On laparoscopy, I find that there is no non-communicating horn, but on the right side, we find that there is a bulge. There is a bulge here, and uh, uh, correlating with the sonography finding of uh, an anechoic collection, or uh, thinking that it could be hematometra, partial hematometra on the other side, right side, we put with the same current. Uh, this is the procedure where we get bipolar Collins knife and uh, go very gently because see the prominence of the, uh, the right projection to the cavity. And once you go deep inside with the control and uh, you see, uh, still we are not able to find out anything for that. And uh, I feel that this is a good job. We can find it out by a hysteroscopic procedure. It's a very atypical case of uh, the septum not connected to the original cavity. And uh, here we can see the two ostium, uh, the one ostium, but the other ostium is not being found and it is not connected with that. So slowly we are going to find out again entrance into that. And now uh, with the uh, laterally in the same plane, we have to go and find out whether there is something or the connection is there or not. Now we could find that, yes, there is a altered blood which is coming. And that is the point where the sonographic say that, yes, it's a collection in that. And old blood is coming from that. And uh, 
this is a non communicating septum to the other healthy horn or a communicating horn and this is how hysteroscopy is a very very rewarding surgery for this particular case for that and believe me after that uh, the patient is completely relieved of pain and then subsequently uh, married and uh, have an uneventful pregnancy and uh, the mother of two children by now for that so this is how the hysteroscopy is a boon for fertility not only fertility augmentation but for the treatment of this type of atypical cases for that and these are the cases where the other horns and the original communicating horns are just uh, uh, made same and uh, you can see the ostium now the other ostium can be very well seen after the procedure is over and this is another type of septum a typical septum where they manifested with severe dysmenorrhea with the hematometra the partial uh, acquired hematometra on the other side uh, the congenital hematometra on the other side of one half for that so this will give a suspicion of that a couple of cases like this we have found out and this i find that this atypical case i must share with you and uh, I, so that it can be a learning for the junior the next gen uh, people for that so always you don't find a classical cases but uh, see and apply your brain and uh, apply your technology and that can help you in really getting a good service for that and a good piece of surgery for that now coming to the intrauterine adhesions one of the i have told that in laparoscopic conservative surgery uh, fertility promoting surgery for endometriosis is one of the uh, pinnacle and here in uh, hysteroscopy the pinnacle and most difficult is a uh, hasselman syndrome intrauterine adhesion and more so the degree of adhesion is related to the prognosis the goal and means what you do it goal of this intrauterine adhesion restore uterine architecture to normal how you can make it it means lysis under direct vision you can do it only by hysteroscopy lysis under direct vision prevent readherence you can use intrauterine splint or some other procedure promote endometrial overgrowth you give some hormones high dose and verify cavity normalcy follow up histogram or hysteroscopy after a couple of months for that so these are goals of that and this is the classification of intrauterine adhesion by hysteroscopic findings severe adhesion more than 3/4 of the uterine cavity is involved agglutination of walls or thick bands ostial areas and upper cavity occluded moderate is 1/4 to 3/4 of the uterine cavity involved no agglutination of walls adhesions only ostial areas and upper fundus only partially occluded and minimal less than 1/4 of the uterine cavity involved thin or flimsy adhesions ostial areas and upper fundus minimally involved are clear believe me in a case of tuberculosis we find a complete uh, uh, synechia for that and that becomes a little prognosis is worse for that but in a case of minimal to moderate synechia adhesions i think you can restore the uterine cavity and uh, uh, promote the fertility as well as the menstrual function for that so this is how with the uh, forceps you can just lyse it even this can be lysed with the uh, telescope and the seat for that if you are a complete the band of adhesions you can catch hold of that and just twist it and you can find a, create a good cavity for that without uh, the uh, um, electrosurgical device because electrosurgical device has a risk of uh, that you do not know that's why we always do under uh, laparoscopic guidance and uh, severe the adhesions more is the indication of doing the laparoscopic guidance for that and this is how we complete the procedure of asserman the good cavity is being formed here after gradually in all areas you find and just twist it the adhesions and and then you can add it with the estrogen progesterone combination or a primarin for a couple of months and then uh, do the job for that many people use the intrauterine device copper t or lipis loop also lipis loop is not available why do the more touch area is much better than the copper t so why do the area of contact better is for the asynechia prevention for that now this is a case have a look on that this is a case where uh, uh, you put it the scope inside and uh, go inside and find that yes uh, uh, there is a complete uterine asynechia i got a couple of cases refer from a hysteroscopist that is a complete asynechia for synecolysis i put a scope on that and again we find that there is another hole black hole in the top so 
you just turn the telescope upwards and find this is a synechia this is so called synechia where you just is misleading and you go and find a normal cavity for that so this is a false passage which gives erroneous idea of synechia so be aware and this is a trick i am giving you while doing a hysteroscopy look for that if there is a synechia whether it's in the correct plane is whether it's a false passage or it's a real cavity for that so this is a lesson for all gynecologists that this uh, happens for that now this is a, again a synechial is a band of adhesions fortunately these are synechia bands synechial bands and it's a flimsy bands for that and with a uh, telescope with the seed or with your uh, scissor or with your uh, grasper uh, the blunt uh, the uh, forceps hysteroscopic forceps you can just uh, twist it and just break the synechia and uh, completely you find a good cavity for that for fertility as well as for the recurrent pregnancy loss for that so i have already told that yes minimal to moderate synechia better is the prognosis and severe synechia whatever you do i think i am really vexed with the severe synechia even you try for all methods it's not very useful uh, maybe that in uh, repeated seating i've done couple of cases i remember in repeated seating the patient was in secondary amenorrhea has menstruated and uh, um, about 20% do conceive after the procedure that will depend on the grades of synechia for that but a good job you can do it with the hysteroscopy and for uh, the pregnancy outcome will be very good for that again this is another case uh, of uh, uh, the synechia which uh, mimics uh, as if it's a septum but it's a septum it's a one the one side and you find a band it's cut and it's a septum it's not a septum it's a synechial band and this synechial band can give rise to the recurrent pregnancy loss and this band occurs uh, many times after an induced abortion induced abortion where you do a curatase many people do a curatase and infection giving rise to the band and if there is an incomplete synechia like this and prognosis is very good for that and it can be done with very uh, reasonable uh, skill now next is about the myoma hysteroscopic resect resection of the myoma intrauterine myoma that is mainly restricted to the submucous variety if you classify the figo varieties from 0 to 8 i think 0 1 and 2 can be best tackled with the hysteroscope for that and expert uh, endoscopy hysteroscopists can do up till about 3 uh, but 0 uh, 1 and 2 can be better dealt with With this and this is a case where uh, the vascular pedicle is coagulated at the base and then going for a resection you can find the difference between this tissue texture and the polyp from looking at that you can say that it is a myoma it's not a polyp and after resection you can find the uh, muscle you can find the muscle wall rutan muscular uh, thing a myoma if you cut a gif a myoma the texture is same as that so before going for that analysis of symptomatology is well what for she has come whether she has come for a um, menorrhagic cycle these are the cases where adolescent girl also they present uh, tons and tons of hormones they are not responding you do a sonography they will give a small uh, uh, either a myoma or a polyp or a hyper or a hyperplastic uh, uh, endometrium for that and non responding to that you put a scope and find that there is a small myoma submucous myoma and that is the best rewarding surgery for this unmarried girl for that and same thing happened with the space occupying lesion giving rise to recurrent pregnancy loss and also infertility and abnormal uterine bleeding all these were the one to keep the pregnancy i think you go with that the only problem is that the timing don't go and you do it with the bipolar spectroscope even with the bipolar you are using the saline you know the see that the fluid balance has to be maintained regional anesthesia is much better as i have already told you and uh, uh, as far as possible quickly you uh, do it the procedure shorter the period of surgery better is the uh, outcome because the absorption will be less but still have a vigilance on that you can give a, uh, a diuretic if there is any problem and uh, majority of the cases uh, that can be averted the pulmonary edema can be averted prevented or treated by giving an excessive diuretic therapy for that so one of the thing in uh, myoma resection is that this is if there is a grade 0 uh, 
it's very well very easy for that but in grade 1 and grade 2 the base has to be there and you have to uh, remove the myoma completely from the base and uh, from the muscle tissue from the capsule you can delineate the capsule and all that with high resolution uh, camera like uh, chroma and clara of hd i think uh, we can clearly delineate the uh, which is the capsule for that and you can uh, remove it in a cup wise fashion go deeper and uh, find out that at the same level you can find out otherwise in a grade zero you just uh, at the same level you remove it everything is okay for that but in grade 2 and grade 3 once you cut the more of the tissues will prop out for that and it's easier that you do the procedure and see the amount of uh, tissue which can be removed and send it for his histopathological examination for that this is again a case of submucous myoma and uh, you just evaluate the both the ostia the surface and uh, now the both the ostia and surface is seen and this is a myoma uh, again uh, laparoscopy this is a case of infertility and with menorrhagic cycle and therefore laparoscopy concomitant laparoscopy is done otherwise for this myoma resection laparoscopy is not ma ma mandatory for that and uh, these are the cases where you can completely do the job of evaluating the infertility as well as the myoma resection for better outcome in terms of prevent elevating the menorrhagic cycle or uh, removing the space occupying lesion for enhancing the fertility for that now the same thing with the loop loop is the best instrument for that and i have already told that this myoma is little difficult because it's anterior i told that yes previously we see the posterior myoma is anterior and lateral lateral is little better and posterior is little better but more anterior is difficult for that it is uh, the therefore you rotate in all directions to find out for that but anterior becomes very very difficult fundal becomes very difficult because orientation of the loop and uh, resection becomes a ba major part and difficulty for that so these are the method in which we do it and any uh, bleeding active bleeders we just this is a cutting current we apply the coagulation current for that and uh, you can find the difference between that uh, which is the capsule you can find that after uh, resection you can locate which is the capsule now this is the capsule can you can you find it out that this is the capsule where it is lifted and uh, that is the capsule that is the point where you go a little uh, more deeper inside and just lift it with the uh, loop so that the whole myoma can be lifted out for that and at the end of the procedure you can find a gutter and there are a, are a well inside so that the myoma of grade 2 1 and grade 2 can be uh, retrieved for that you can find out that the whole capsule has been uh, so this is the technique by the resolution of the tele i mean camera you can do a good job and you can clearly differentiate which is the myomatous tissue and which is the muscle and which is the cleavage for that also and this is how it's not that bewailing it and making it at the same level as uterine cavity will do the job that is only for grade 0 otherwise in grade 1 and grade 2 it is not possible for that is again uh, a submucous myoma you can find that yes uh, this is a case where you go above and this is easier because it's a, a posterior fibroid it's easier to posterior fibroid is little easier only thing is that the anterior wall and the cervical fibroid that creates a lot of problem for that and the same procedure we find it out this is a case where we find it's in the endocervical canal but uh, uh, the upper end can be very well located for that so that you can reach it at the higher end and start from the higher end with the loop and from above downwards you just resect it at one go from top from above downwards so that the whole of the chunk can be removed for that also and uh, believe me this uh, rapidly you can do it with the vision and uh, uh, the same capsule they can find that still there are some myomatous tissue which is there and uh, identification of the uh, level where uh, you see the capsule and the clear uh, muscle in between you can find that this is the myomatous tissue and the muscle you can clearly find the difference in that and uh, by resection uh, uh, with the help of the good vision of the camera chlora 
Lara and uh, Chroma, you can, Lara and Chroma can give an idea as to the differentiation of the tissues for that, so that you don't uh, leave part of the myoma inside for that. And uh, you, from this resection, you can see that how beautifully uh, you can see the completeness of the procedure. And it takes little um, more time and a little, little uh, skill in surgery, uh, but you can do the job. Any average gynecologist can do the job for that because you have to produce here, it is deep inside, it's like a well, so that uh, you uh, deliver that. Now, this is a case where I was telling that it's an anterior myoma, anterior wall submucous myoma. And here the negotiation of the instrument can be reversed with that. You just change it and reverse um, the resectoscope uh, uh, in, as compared to the posterior and remove that. So this is a little difficult to handle, but it can be done with the same thing. Only thing is that the orientation of the resectoscope should be just different from those in the, in the posterior myoma for that. That is the only thing. And the myoma in the fundus, again, there is a space and uh, from the left to right or right to left, you can just go so that you protect the fundus, don't have a injury or perforation in the fundus. At the same time, remove the myomatous tissue in complete go for that in one sitting for that. In cases where you find multiple myoma, submucous myoma in three or four myomas, don't do it in same sitting. You have to do uh, particularly opposing surface if anterior and posterior there uh, because there is a risk of uh, synechia, you have to do in a second sitting or you do a check hysteroscopy and find out and break the synechia for that. That's the only thing. And in a bigger size myoma, up till five, five centimeter in one setting, you can go it. But beyond that, in phased manner, you can do it. You do in two, two sitting, there is not a problem for that. You just uh, enucleate it and then after one month or one and a half months, you can again subsequently do it so that in phase manner you can do the procedure uh, for completeness of the cases. Now, this is a case where uh, you again, you find that the cavity, we have done that. This is the cavity and uh, the sonography says that it's a myoma uterus, but where is the myoma? Now we can find the myoma is in the cervical region. Now, endocervical canal, there is a bulge in that endocervical canal and the myoma is originating from the posterior wall of the endocervical canal and the big myoma completely filling the cavity. So these are the difficult cases where the same procedure, you do. the cavity is absolutely normal, both ostia can be very well seen and you start from above at the boundary, go above the myoma at the lower corpus level, you just find out and then enucleate the myomal tissue. But this is the these are the two difficulties, situation of the myoma, location of the myoma, number of the myoma, and uh, uh, of course, the size of the myoma are all determining factors uh, for surgical surgery. You have to decide and give, give a good decision and dissection for that so that you can do a good job in a case of myoma resection for that. Now, this is a case where uh, uh, the morselator in, in comparison to the electrosurgical device, this is a saver system or a morselator to and fro movement with the mechanical, just normal saline and mechanical to and fro movement is the submucous myoma, which uh, you touch it, touch it and uh, rotate it on either side. And uh, just uh, the, it could be uh, reduced to small particles and uh, you aspirate it, suction is there, you aspirate the, Gravel this to small particles and hold the procedure is out. The only thing is that uh, it could be for a, a small or a medium size submucous myoma can be better. Large myoma, it takes a longer time. It's difficult. Otherwise, <laughs> the advantage is that you don't uh, have to require an electrosurgical device. And with the normal thing, you morsel it and gravel it uh, to a small particle like sand and then give a suction for that. And... Uh, the another problem is about the histopathologic uh, thing and all that. You have to uh, bring all the um, return liquid and filter it and then send it. But uh, the difficulty in biopsy, histopathological thing and all that. But this is a system where, saver system or a morselator, I'm a morselator, which uh, can be done. And this is one method which I've sold in other than the electrosurgical uh, thing like uh, 
resectoscope. You don't have to put a resectoscope here. These are small dimensions, about seven millimeter. And uh, with the same four millimeter telescope, you just with the seed that the seed is different. And uh, the seed, the upper end of the morselator, there's a bevel end that goes to 180 degree to and from movement and chart the tissue. And uh, then by suction is completely out for that also. So the whole myoma can be removed and you can see the base is almost removed, the myoma of about three to four centimeter. And you can see the base and marcellator is clearing the base for that. If it is go inside also in, in uh, uh, type one or type two also, it can be done. It can be done without use of the electrosurgical energy sources. So this is how, this is another example of this. Now coming to the hysteroscopic tubal cannulation is another, is a cannulation. I will just demonstrate, people ask about the cannulation set. The India, indigenous and uh, Cooks is very costly. I use the indigenous cannulation set. There are three sets. One is the stilet with the uh, cable. Another is the uh, Teflon wire. The Teflon wire is introduced into that uh, after the stilet is being removed. And uh, this is one example when we find that this is a hysteroscopy view of proximal tubal block by hysterosalpingraphy. This is the same stilet with the cannula cannulation catheter. You just introduce it, remove the stilet, put the, put the uh, Teflon wire and go inside and just cross it and then put the dye. Uh, you can find that the cannulation is complete. It's a very easy procedure, any ordinary gynecology. The only thing is that the orientation is important. You just go gently and orientation uh, is required for the assistant also and uh, just uh, negotiate it. You go closer to that, the telescope closer to the ostium and then introduce it with that. And therefore, uh, after the end of the procedure, either you can do a selective cannulation, selective chromoperturbation, or you can introduce the, uh, the Teflon wire. And majority of these are the mucus blocks obstructing at the level of the isthmus uh, or interstitial portion. And therefore, you just negotiate up till about the proximal ampulla or isthmus, the whole thing is done. And these are all rewarding surgery for that. So after the end of the procedure, you just uh, irrigate it with the normal saline and hold the procedure is over for that. This is another case uh, uh, where ostium is not very well seen. So normally there it sees as a, as a pit. You just at that time, the negotiation is very, very important. At that particular pit, you just negotiate it and introduce your cannulation catheter for that. That's very important. And uh, uh, after uh, introducing it, you can put the Teflon wire and you can find that, yes, this is the uh, thing. You go closer to that. A good orientation is necessary. And uh, it uh, depends on the location of the ostium and uh, your telescope and the operative seed. It's an operative seed which is there and this seven millimeter operative seed can uh, do the job for that. And then you can find that, yes, this is the uh, cannula. This is the tubal cannulation set and a cannula with the stilet. You just introduce it and remove the stilet and insert the guide wire, insert the Teflon guide wire. And this Teflon catheter, you introduce it and it's so designed that is not going to uh, produce any complications or injury for that. Earlier, we used to have a urologic catheter and the ureteric catheter is very tough. It is likely to perforate because it's a very blunt, uh, tough uh, um, area. It's not malleable like this particular catheter designed by that. And Cook's, has, Cook's uh, catheter is very costly and we have Indianized catheter. The other, there are many companies who sold, I think uh, PB, I bring from PB and, uh, and this is a very good job for that. Now, after introduction of this, we put the catheter, there is, a, there is a fluid coming out and all that. The other side is already done. This side, this side you can negotiate under laparoscopic guidance. You can see that selective chromoperturbation, the dye didn't come. And therefore we put the Teflon catheter. We put the Teflon catheter under guidance and this side and the other side, uh, the, uh, the uh, fluid came, but in this side, the right side, we negotiate with that. And uh, believe me, 
this uh, laparoscopic grasper will guide the tube and uh, inside you just push it so that whole thing the catheter can be completely inside so in a proximal tubal convolution this catheter up till this is not required for that but in multi segment or where it is a failure you put this guide wire and now it's complete for that and then uh, this is the catheter inside the teflon wire where you just uh, do the catheterization with a very simple way and then test it with the uh, dye and glue i mean the it will come that trias patency is restored this is a very rewarding surgery for fertility and many of the cases who are planned for uh, assisted reproduction i think do this procedure and you will be very satisfied that yes this procedure gives a very rewarding result for that also this is another case uh, as i was telling you this is another case where the polyp you can see the polyp this is a polyp where it needs a resection this is a case of uh, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss along with that she is presented with secondary infertility so the sonography says that yes uh, there is a myoma but here we find a polyp polyp on the left lateral wall a septum a large septum almost around 2/3 of the cavity and now we are doing a polypectomy initially doing a polyp because nothing was visible for that and uh, believe me as i was telling that this is another case where four in one four pathologies there the absent one case there is another case second it's a uh, unlucky patient but lucky uh, gynecologist say then doing a same sitting uh, resection of the septum polypectomy and after the till that time uh, i have not detected a myoma but uh, as we go more towards the ostium area on the left side on the right side i find uh, on the left side i find that there is there is a there is a submucous myoma so the other uh, uh, the right uh, the left uh, um, right ostium is very well seen the left ostium is not seen and uh, now we can find that yes this is uh, an area where uh, the myoma submucous myoma is seen for that and uh, this myoma is a very uh, the situation as i have already told the location of the myoma is such that the resection becomes little tricky and difficult for that but once the septum is out we get a more of space the septoplasty will allow us to find out more of space so that we change the uh, collins knife to the loop and with the loop electrode we can do the uh, myoma resection so this is one case where uh, the four things can be done the polyp polypectomy uh, septum resection myoma resection and uh, convolution all three can be done here in the same sitting to give a complete uh, uh, i think surgery for that so that we don't do an incomplete surgery whatever we find but this patient is very very unlucky to have all these and uh, the surgeon i think uh, must try is all its effort to give a best chance for our uh, uh, problem and this is a thing which you find that on the uh, right side we can find that yes uh, on uh, that is a jejamaima submucous myoma on one horn of the uh, it was so it's delicate that after after getting a space for removing the septum we can tackle the myoma and then the myoma resection can be done so that the complete good uterine cavity can be formed with the tubal patency restored by doing a convolution for that this is a broad septum and a very uh, thick septum for that and therefore these are the cases where electro surgery can be a better option than the seizure this type of septum cannot be dealt with seizure seizure only when there is a thin septum it can be better dealt with otherwise this uh, uh, electro surgical particularly the bipolar resectoscope will be a better alternative for that and uh, can do a better job for that so this is uh, how we just uh, uh, have a resection of the septum i have already told about if there is a good uh, fibromuscular component remnant inside uh, without retraction uh, it should come out if there is a still the bulge and all that you can just resect it uh, by the uh, the loop and remove that tissues also otherwise tissue removal is not necessary for that and uh, that is why that is how you do the uh, the surgery in one sitting you can do that but uh, the after tcrs we get a space 
so that we can do this uh, uh, myoma resection for them. This is the area where we find the pinkish area is there, and that is the limit of uh, the uh, septum for them. Now, after we get a little area uh, for going the loop behind the above the level of the myoma, uh, submucous myoma, things become very easy, and we can do the job for that. And uh, this is how we do that now. Now the location is such that we can really is feasible to enucleate the myoma by putting a loop inside. And I'm changing the loop and uh, just resecting this because I've got the space after the septum resection. You can clearly find that this is a myoma which can be removed very well after the space is being created for that also. Now coming to the IUCD. The, many of the cases, they displaced IUCD. We make a blind effort uh, when there is a missing thread for that and do a repeated DNC for that. But uh, believe me, this is one of the case where uh, you put, uh, see that the thread is gone inside. It is uh, just uh, catching the thread uh, by the uh, forceps and bringing it will solve the problem for that. It's a very simple procedure. Within uh, minutes, it can be done. And under vision, most important is things that under vision you can remove it, not blindly you can remove it. And grasping the thread and just dragging it is a very simple affair for that. You just grasp it with the grasping forceps and just bring the whole IUCD out uh, and this serves the purpose for that. So this is uh, another example of uh, the IUCD, foreign body IUCD removal and a missing thread by under hysteroscopic guidance you can remove this. This is another case where there's a displaced loop where uh, it is almost around more than six, seven years. The copper is already gone and uh, the thread is inside the uterine cavity. Maybe that uh, the, uh, it is in the normal position of the vertical arm and the horizontal arm, but still it needs a removal. And this is a multi-load copper uh, device. And uh, this, again, same thing. Uh, it's very easy to put uh, to grasp the thread uh, of the multi-load and then remove the um, thing and do the procedure for that. The same thing you can see the both the procedures, uh, all the three three things. Uh, it hardly requires any. Only thing is that with the operative uh, seed, you just introduce your grasping forceps and remove it, and uh, under vision it can be removed for that. So this is a very common thing where a hysteroscopy uh, is of great help to the gynecologist and uh, doing a good job for that. Now, these are, uh, this is again another case where uh, some of you must have experienced this. They present this present presented with uh, secondary infertility and sonography demonstrate that there is a hyperechoic uh, um, hyperechoic uh, part in the cavity and this can give a suspicion of uh, osseous material or a bony spicule in a previous uh, pregnancy and uh, or abortion and this uh, when you put a hysteroscope you find and you confirm that this is a bony spicules which is there and uh, it's not the only one spicule it's a lot of spicules which is there a lot of bones which is there and uh, Hysteroscope can only help it and uh, uh, remove it. And this could be one of the cause of secondary infertility because it acts like an IUCD. So uh, you just uh, catch hold of the uh, part and piece by piece, you remove it. And uh, under vision, you can do a good job for that. So um, this uh, is again a scope for an osseous material, a foreign body, which can be uh, removed by hysteroscopy for that. It's like a bone which has come out, as if it's a long bone which has uh, come out and handing over for that. So there are a lot of spicules of bone here so that the cavity is completely filled with osseous material and uh, all things completely, you have to remove it. Otherwise, your chances of pregnancy will not be there. The second infancy has come with second infertility with one abortion and cavity should be well formed and uh, the foreign body should be removed for that. This is how you remove this and uh, complete the procedure. Again, there's a lot of, uh, this could be, and uh, it's not uh, 
abortion, at least uh, I hope that it could be 12, 14 week size, more than that. It cannot be uh, before that. And therefore we find a lot of bones and spicules inside for that. Maybe she has underwent uh, uh, evacuation and still uh, the bones are left behind and uh, you remove it by the under vision. Under vision, you remove it and uh, display and the cavity is well formed after the end of the procedure. And uh, you can find uh, the bones, like long bones, it is appearing like that. And uh, a good, uh, all the bones could be removed and could give a good uh, prognosis for this particular patient presenting with uh, secondary infertility for that. So this is not very uncommon. You find uh, uh, quite a good number of cases. I find that these are the um, cases responsible for second infertility. Of course, this sonography can guide you. Sonography can help you when you find a hyperechoic area. Either it's a IUCD or uh, uh, it's a bony material, bony segment for that. And uh, you do that bony spicules, remove that bony spicules completely and uh, empty the cavity so that the prognosis is very good. And luckily this patient after that, the next, uh, after two months he conceived and, uh, and already delivered this particular uh, one baby after the second infertility of one abortion. She doesn't have any, one abortion is there. Now everything is, you can find that yes, uh, whole cavity is well formed. There is an arcuate uterus, small septum arcuate, but the whole of the osseous material is out. No foreign body, you check it with that. And these are the, at the end of the procedure, you demonstrate that these are the bony spicules which can be recovered on uh, that. So this is one indication. Another foreign body, I have a very interesting example in case, a young uh, adolescent girl of about 16 years came with foul smelling discharge for months together. She went far from, uh, and she consulted many, many uh, gynecologists and all that, antibiotics and all that. And uh, I thought I will do a, uh, an examination under anesthesia. When I did an examination under anesthesia of all smelling discharge from one pit, and it's a blind vagina, as if it's a blind vagina in one pit, there is a foul smelling discharge. And uh, I put uh, this discharge. This is an opening in that. Uh, this is an opening where uh, purulent material was coming. Then I, after dilatation, uh, I put my hysteroscope inside. And this is a hysteroscope inside. And on hysteroscope, I find that there is a foreign body. And uh, then I uh, removed this particular thing, guided with this guide, I found that there is a uh, metal, there is a metallic portion in the vagina and uh, this is a plastic, plastic and uh, then again, I put a hysteroscopy, I find another, another material is inside that. So vaginoscopic examination can give an idea of uh, a foreign body and uh, this foreign body is nothing but some some, uh, I think, material which uh, the young, curious uh, uh, girl has introduced it uh, as a game. And uh, it stayed for months together and years together, giving rise to infection, giving rise to atresia, secondary vaginal atresia, and uh, discharge of pus. So this is a hysteroscopy has helped me as a guide. I introduced it through the point and then through the point I opened up and uh, the, remove that foreign body for that. So this is an important thing for vaginoscopy for foreign body. And now the patient is absolutely all right. For that. Now, this is a case where um, she presented with uh, repeated bleeding, underwent suction evacuation uh, four times. Suction evacuation four times by four different gynecologists. And ultimately, if the bleeding continues, and every time he does the ultrasound, there is a RPOC for that. I thought we'll do it under under hysteroscopic guidance for that. Let me put a scope and find out. When I put a telescope, when I hysteroscope, there is a septum and uh, the one of the horn, the uh, POC was there. So whatever may be the uh, suction cannula and other methods, is not able to uh, approach the part where the product of conception was there. So this was the part of the product of conception, which is lying on the uh, right, ostia, right uh, horn. And uh, you just uh, with the grasper, you introduce it. And therefore, this is, I find that this is the cause of uh, the failure and repeated uh, abortions. It's repeated evacuation by gynecologist, experienced gynecologist is not going to help in all that. So, hysteroscopy <coughs> in this type of situation 
is very helpful uh, because the patient is bleeding bleeding without and any amount of uh, medications is not going to help and every time you do a scan you find um, um, uh, the uh, mixed echogenic uh, area of about 3 cm diameter inside the uterine cavity and uh, even with that uh, 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 the suction evacuation it is not being removed so because we find that this uh, uh, rpoc is there hidden in one of the cornu one of the cornu and that is very difficult and that is the only possibility under direct vision you have to remove it and I, this is a real help of the hysteroscopy and all that i don't say that all cases you do suction evacuation after suction in complete abortion you do under hysteroscopy but these are the cases where repeated evacuation is not able to uh, clear it you think that it could be somewhere else and uh, at the end of the procedure i completed the procedure with that it took a little uh, piece by piece of research is an organized product and uh, i cannot introduce the canula with that and uh, this is how with the grasping forceps with repeated attempts i could remove their procedure for that also so whole uh, cavity whole uh, poc can be retrieved and the well formed uh, cavity well formed uh, uh, horn can be seen after the end of the procedure for that because it's a very very organized product about 4 months old it took a long time for removal of that this is absolutely an unedited uh, video which i am demonstrating but i am giving an, uh, an example that such things can happen and uh, hysteroscopy can really solve the purpose for uh, this type of cases where uh, the failure is there and under vision you can deliver the uh, product of conception uh, very well for that and this is the end of the procedure where all the products are being removed and the ostium the horn can be very well seen uh, at the end of the procedure that yes nothing is left behind and it's an end for that now this is a case where uh, lateral metroplasty this uh, um, i've done quite a good number of cases of lateral metroplasty but uh, the results are not very very rewarding for that the indications are either a, a, a uniconvex uterus or a t shaped uterus or a hypoplastic uterus you just the procedure is very simple augmentation of the cavity uh, if uh, particularly if you are going for an iui uh, the iv procedure the cavity is very small you just go and with the either with the collins knife or with the uh, bipolar electrode you just make a line and the lateral wall of the uterus on either side and broaden the cavity that is the concept behind that but uh, uh, i have done quite a few cases but uh, i can say that it's not very rewarding i'm not very happy with the procedure and got a success rate with that i don't claim that but uh, um, there are many reports available for lateral metroplasty which is satisfying particularly for t shaped uterus for that i'm convinced that in t shaped uterus it's very good but it's not very um, rewarding for the cases like this and uniconvex uterus or a tubular uterus post myomectomy uterus all these could be one of the indications but the results are still a million dollar question and a big uh, question mark for that so on both the sides you just give two lines and a depth slowly you go because uh, if you go very deep there is a risk of injuring to the uterine artery so once uh, so that is why the precaution has to be taken go very slow gently and as far as possible uh, don't go more towards the uterine artery very laterally uterine artery is there at least 5 uh, mm depth is enough for that don't go more than that and that gives a uh, reasonable augmentation of the cavity of the uterus for that endometrial ablation and resection i think uh, uh, we have done earlier about a decade before uh, quite a good number of cases of endometrial ablation and resection indication of a i have already told that aub young age wants to preserve the uterus and uh, uh, instead of removing the uterus you ablate it because you remove the endometrium for that those so the patient selection and preparation is <laughs> important the technique is we do with we resectoscope technique the alternative technique i have told that the thermal balloon ablation is there the controversy lies in one factor that 
If at all you are not able to completely remove one chunk of the endometrium is kept behind, that gives rise to crypto, um, I think, hematometra, parcel hematometra, and terrible dysmenorrhea. There's one. And second is that if at all that chance of malignancy is going to happen, that is not detected earlier. And that is a big question mark for which uh, the debate still continues whether to go ahead with this resection or some of the alternative methods for that. Hysteroscopic sterilization. Again, I am told that it is very difficult to uh, clip the tube from outside than from inside. So normally the failure rate of uh, plugging the, uh, if you plug the osteal end, uh, the failure is uh, more than uh, if you're going to clip it from above. So electrocoagulation, cryocoagulation, about 80% failure will be there. Non-destructive occlusion device, like uh, a mechanical device, like uh, the Assure is there, you can use it and a lot of trials have been there with Assure and interactable device like Hamu, injection of chemicals like quinacrine, gelatin, resorcinol, formaldehyde, MCA could be there for that. But ultimately, it is yet to be rewarding for that. And it's not very uh, reassuring, excepting Assure, which has done a lot of publication, but uh, the results are not very rewarding for that. Now, coming to the complications in the last early secondary to uterine distance, and I've already told, if you are using the carbon dioxide, we are not using the gas, only the liquid medium can give rise to anaphylaxis, fluid overload, and dilutional hyponatremia syndrome, non cardiogenic pulmonary edema for that. And uh, secondary to the intervention, like cervical tear, uterine perforation, bleeding, thermal injury uh, will be there. And late in like infection, bleeding, sinicia, pregnancy, and cancer, of course, uh, I've already told for that. So these are a few examples of uh, complications faced by me. I have done that personal cases, which I say that Mrs. X case of RPL planned for diagnostic hysteroscopy and cavity evaluation, diagnosed as complete uterine sinicia and second opinion short that I was showing the same case. It was a false passage. So how to minimize and prevent false passage and how to recognize the same case, which I have already shown it. The same case is a, a, initially it was thought there is a sinicia. Then the second opinion, when I came and found out to my trainees that yes, you put the scope little down and look at the top. There is a area black hole is there and that black hole has given me a guide that yes, it's not the cavity, the cavity is above. And this is a case which I've already shown you. And this is, uh, in that case, it's preventable to do a uh, the uh, vaginoscopic examination and vaginoscopic uh, hysteroscopy can be an alternative problem. So improper dilatation is the factor for that. Visibility and orientation, change of direction of scope, double channel seats, and gentleness with negotiation without resistance is the key for that. And no additional treatment is necessary. Once uh, there is a false passage, uh, it's not gone for a perforation. Nothing is to be worried about that. But only thing is that it could be avoided. You can use a misoprostol to avoid that or do a vaginoscopic hysteroscopy to avoid that. Situation two, Mrs. White, 25 years, primary infertility, five years, plan for DHL, DH cavity visualized, and after visualization immediately collapsed. So when suspicion, when you're not able to see the cavity after introduction of the first suspect that there could be a uh, perforation for that. And then immediately it was confirmed and there was a fundal perforation and uh, there the uh, laparoscopy, uh, concomitant laparoscopy diagnosis and itself the bleeding could be controlled by just coagulation. And the only problem is that the dye test could not be done. But in a small rent, you grasp with a grasper, laparoscopic grasper, you just occlude the rent and can do a um, um, dye test to find out that yes, tubes are patterned or not. And of course, a coagulation and then subsequently uh, you can be, this is a site of weakness, could be giving rise to a rupture in the latter part. But Normally with a small bore dilator like four, five or six, uh, it doesn't happen the, after this procedure. Uh, you just coagulate it, clean it. And then subsequently, many of the patients do have a good favorable outcome for that in pregnancy and complications are less. But still there is a weak, weak point for that. But uh, laparoscopy can help you in detection as well as managing the particular case. But this could be prevented as far as possible Dilatation should be very gentle. A 0.5 millimeter dilator should be used and preferably uh, the misoprostol can prevent the use for that and don't push it. Many things is that always dilatation 
uh, you just have a gentle dilatation. And wherever you negotiate, you go it. Wherever there is a resistance, you don't go it for that. And acute antibiotic or acute retrovirus could be a problem for that. But basic philosophy is that you just don't uh, push it and or negotiate it, automatically it will go. And this is a better thing that uh, and under anesthesia is much better. Office procedure, again, there is a problem because office procedure, we do not use the dilator. You use the resector, the uh, whole thing is the telescope and the seat. And the telescope and the seat could produce a, also a perforation for that where there could be a problem. You have to shift to the OT for that. Situation three, Mrs. Three, Mrs. C, 30 years, uh, primary infantry, eight years, case of prime bilateral proximal tuber block, plan for hysteroscopic annulation. Teflon tip perforated. Then you see that this is a case where the, uh, the uh, convolution is attempted. You can see from the video what is uh, what has happened for that. So normally we do that hysteroscopic convolution immediately. This is the outer, uh, the uh, cannula seed, convolution um, seed, and through it the Teflon seed has to be introduced after removal of the stent. And uh, uh, the same thing we did it and uh, you can see that here, uh, the procedure is absolutely negotiated. There is no problem here. And uh, main thing, uh, so therefore the characteristics of the, uh, the uh, Teflon is important. It must be there. You go and negotiate with the laparoscopic guidance, we do it. And you can see that uh, the cannula, I'm not able to see the cannula, uh, the Teflon, the cannulation catheter, Teflon catheter is not seen. now. Is just negotiating the cornwall and just negotiating the isthmus and the interstitial portion. And uh, now we can find that, yes, it's a, there is a, some, I feel that there is a, some difficulty in negotiating that. So this could give a hint that uh, this is in a different plane because it's uh, easy to, if a uh, convolution is easier, then it would go easily. There could be some, I suspected that there could be some fibrotic thing, some organic thing, but it's not very, uh, obvious because outside it looks absolutely normal. It's not a pathological tube and uh, maybe that the negotiation there is a little problem for that. So it's a fault of uh, the surgeon who has negotiated with that and uh, uh, we find that yes, uh, the whole of the tube it has not come out. Now this, now you can see that the, it has perforated at the, at the junction of the isthmus and ampulla. So this is a uh, very, very atypical case, which I find, and uh, this is my own case. I have done the perforation, and uh, but still I didn't lose patience on that. I just withdrawn this Teflon catheter, and uh, I withdrawn it completely, straightened the tube, and again negotiated, and tried to negotiate the original thing, because uh, that was the area of perforation. Because I had not uh, straightened the tube, it has not gone through the right direction for that. And once uh, I've negotiated it, it has now gone to the right direction. The, you can see that uh, the convolution catheter has gone and I have negotiated the whole of the tube. And uh, then I could find that, yes, uh, the, it is up to the level of the isthmus. It could be detected. The whole uh, convolution could be performed very well with this. Now it has emerged out and uh, the the only thing. I was very happy that yes, I could do the procedure with that and uh, subsequently uh, the, the dye test, I, I just sealed it. I just uh, sealed it uh, with the grasper and did the dye test and the dye test becomes positive with a small opening for that. And uh, that is one of the complications which you must be very, very careful. The dye is positive. It can come. You have to, you have to just plug it. The, the part of the uh, rent, uh, small rent, because it's a Teflon, very, very small, minute rent, and it will seal. And it's a very small rent, it could seal, and the patient conceived, and very well, I was expecting that they had land in ectopic pregnancy, tubal pregnancy, but still, um, the patient, uh, I think, is very lucky. And uh, this is a case where present is persistent vaginal bleeding following TCRS, eight hours following surgery. Eight hours following surgery, she has a, a bleeding, and normally in TCRS, in the vascular um, septum, normally at the same time while doing a cutting current, if there is a bleeder, you change into the uh, blend current. 
or coagulation current and touch it. That is the direct control, control of the bleeding. Then putting some tamponade or something like I don't believe in that. But uh, these are the cases where septum can cause this. But you again do that, you do a hysteroscopy again, find out the bleeding vessels and then coagulate it also. So this can serve under direct vision, you can do it or a pediatric follies, you can introduce it as a, as a uh, tamponade for that. But best thing is direct visionation. Prevention is always best for that. This is another case, Mr. Sepp, primary in five years, planned for diagnostic hysteroscopy. laparoscopy. And this is the view of the uh, hysteroscopic uh, uh, view. In this particular case, you can, uh, when I put a telescope, when I put a hysteroscope, I was surprised to find that there is something abnormal, something fishy inside the cavity. And uh, immediately I could say that I'm going through the early pregnancy. And of course, the patient gives a history of a last menses 15 days back. Um, I think that's a very good thing. I always say that take a proper history. If you're giving date or two months later, you must again verify that they exclude pregnancy for that. So this is a pregnancy sac uh, which is there and you can see the embryo through that hysteroscopy and the rent could be found out with that. I confirmed it that this is a case of early pregnancy. The gestational sac is well formed inside the cavity. And uh, I was really sorry that uh, this done. I checked it. And she was having a menses, but it's not a normal menses. It's just spotting. And that could be pregnancy with that. And uh, I lost hope in that particular case. Immediately, I canceled the procedure. But this is a case where the case was uh, detected. And uh, pregnancy continued. I gave it tons and tons of progesterone. Rest, prayed God that this thing uneventful antenatal and intrapartum period. Fortunately, the patient has a continuation of the pregnancy with the project and a male baby doing well about four years back. God is great. And therefore, miracle happens, but miracle doesn't happen always. Miracle happens at times. And I was fortunate, I was lucky. God has blessed me that I had done the blunder, but God has given me the reward for that also. So they conclude. Um, hysteroscopy, these are some basic and hard facts. Every surgery is easy and every surgery is difficult. It's the surgeon that makes the surgery easy or difficult. Gone are the days when hysteroscopy was searching for indications. We have reached a stage where indications are in search of hysteroscopies. There is a dearth of hysteroscopies. I just uh, appeal all the gynecologists and every, if you want to be, can designate yourself as a gynecologist, do become a, a hysteroscopist. And all gynecologists must be hysteroscopists and all that. A very simple procedure. Even if diagnosed, gradually you go by phage manner. Hysteroscopic spectrum is broadened in view of improved visibility, efficient distance and system, newer and refined instruments, efficient power sources, and updated skill of surgeons. Orientation is the key to surgery in hysteroscopy. And hand-eye-foot coordination is the cornerstone, as I'm repeatedly told that this is the thing. So although hysteroscopic complications are uncommon, they're potentially severe and unrecognized. Unrecognized give a fatality for that. Prevention, early recognition of early complications, and immediate management of the basics of hysteroscopic surgery. Non-surgical complications, such as anesthetic complications, and complications due to distance in media, more often encounter than the procedural complications for that. So if you want to master hysteroscopy, the key issues, understand reproductive anatomy and physiology. Expanding horizons of scope and scope is, you must remember. Understand your team and tool. Acquiring the techniques and skills. Minimize complications and maximize the results and all that. And you must know about the reproductive anatomy and physiology. You do good history taking, pelvic examination, sonography, and examination under anesthesia. It is not the technology. It is the tech and the touch which is important. Allied thing, you make a decision for that. And therefore, if you do that, expanding horizons of scope of scopy from diagnostic to operative, from fertility promoting to contraceptive techniques, from benign to malignant, and from simple procedure to more complex procedure for that. So understand your team, anesthesia, fluid balance, circulating nurse, endoscopic technician, dual procedure and assistance you must do, and acquire a skill under perceptorship. Pre of planning, level of learning, method of learning, seminars, workshops, teaching videos, working with tissues, simulators, tutorials, Receptorship, uh, preceptorships and hands-on training credentialing. And that is the purpose of this surgical skill transfer 
e gurukul program which i share some of my surgical techniques you are the best judge whether this is uh, uh, an, a stimulus to you it's not a learning i'm not giving a additional knowledge to you i'm just stimulating you so that you can be a better histoscopist than many many uh, people including me so orientation coordination understanding energy sources new innovations and applications could be there but ultimately the theme is minimizing complication and maximizing results and get best out of the technology and if you devote that i think you can be a good uh, uh, clinicians and a surgeon par excellence and can excel all good surgeons for that oh francis beckon has told not to contradict and confute not to believe and take it for granted not to find and discourse but to weigh and consider you are the best jaws you weigh and consider and then you can say see one do one and teach one it's so simple that you can be a master mastering hysteroscopy thank you very much ladies and gentlemen and my viewers for giving me this opportunity of 11th episode and thanks uh, our uh, juventus academic partner for their really invaluable support and academic partnership and a teaching partnership for my viewers benefit of my viewers and my fellow gynecologists thank you very much thank you very much sir for your such a nice and lucid presentation as always you you keep the uh, audience spell bound uh, sir there are quite a number of uh, queries which have come if you allow me i can share a few yeah yeah if you have a time yeah so sir the first one is from kuch bihar Uh, sorry, from Bhubaneswar, uh, this uh, Dr. Sanjay Chan uh, Chan Ray is saying, "What are the complications of hysteroscopic surgery?" I've only told that hysteroscopic surgery could be related to anesthesia complications, could be related to the medium, distance and medium, or distance and procedure, and operational or procedural complications starting from the uh, the injury, tear, perforation. and uh, it can go across electrosurgical burns can be there also and the procedural complications are less than the anesthetic as well as the distance and medium complications so you must be vigilant about this fluid balance and all that sir uh, dr madhusudan sahu <clears throat> from lake town is saying what's the office hysteroscopy now and i have all the ablation office... and which ablation in aub yeah office hysteroscopy is a name globally is accepted by the hysteroscopic societies also and lot of people are in favor of office hysteroscopy this is basics is that the i have already told office hysteroscopy name is a little uh, given name for marketing procedure for that so office hysteroscopy is a procedure where it can be done in your opd setup and without anesthesia with uh, small dimensions or small diameter of hysteroscope you can do a diagnostic and you can do a minimum uh, operative procedure like a septum you can do it small septum you can do it small myoma you can do it mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. removal of the copper t or icd the common procedures you can do it also for that but major procedures you cannot do it with that office hysteroscopy and it depends on the patient you have to counsel more in my in my practice and all that i get a lot of problem the, my patients are not Uh, really willing for office hysteroscopy because the position itself is a problem position itself is a problem little discomfort will be there for that but at the same time the anesthetic complications will not be there and you can do for a minimum diagnostic and for minimum surgery you can do it also right sir so there is a query from chennai by dr vijay lakshmi uh, tandaswami uh, saying that uh, what about a large submucous myoma how many sittings will be required to do them then how will we know that our septum uh, resection is enough and third part is that uh, is it mandatory to do the lap after septum resection so three parts of our question thank you dr vijay lakshmi i find that in every till you have not missed any episode of that i as far as i remember because you are really very very curious and uh, all these uh, e gurukul program thank you very much ma from my side first of all the myoma size the size of the myoma is important for that sonographically orient it with that the size of the myoma the location of the myoma and the number of the myoma 
So you want to know the size of the marma, maximum size. And uh, sitting, I have told that beyond five centimeter, usually uh, one single sitting, little problem for that. You can do the procedure, but uh, it will take a long time and fluid absorption will be more for that. That will be risky. So for that purpose, we postpone. And uh, in that case, repeated sitting is much more better. And as far as I remember in my practice, in one case, I have done three times. Uh, one of the wife of a police of IPS officer and second in 40D with menorrhagic cycle, large myoma, and there, um, the, is it, is it uh, audible? Yeah, yeah, it is audible, sir. So large myoma. So I did it purposefully in three different sittings and could do the procedure for that also. And I got a rewarding result for that. So believe me, the time is important. If it's taking a long time, and uh, the fluid absorption is more, you stop the procedure, number one, irrespective of the size of the mama. And uh, size of the mama more than five centimeter usually requires repeated sitting, mainly two sittings at an interval of four to six, eight weeks will be enough for that. Then second is about the septum. This is a very common question when you know that the septum resection is complete. Now the septum resection is complete. I've told that there are only the, one thing is that the panoramic view of the two ostium is one aspect. Second aspect, you find that yes, uh, uh, there will be bleeding. The area will be little pinkish rather than whitish so that you can know that you have gone to the muscle. And uh, uh, of course, if you have a, a preoperative assessment of the fundus, particularly the muscle uh, tissue for that, that will be much more better. You can avoid the laparoscopy. Or in the initial phase, you can put a laparoscope and find out the reflections, the color, and you can find that which area you are going, which area you can see the more of the light and uh, say that this area is thinner. So thickness of the muscle can be approximated by laparoscopic guidance, but not in all cases for that. Right, sir. So sir, now there's a query from Katak, uh, Dr. Manoranjan Mahapatra. Uh, he's asking like, can we perform diagnostic PTC in same sitting as during diagnostic? Uh, strain the cavity and the cannula use over dilate the cervix. Your tips, sir. Well, uh, uh, diagnostic and therapeutic can be done in the same setting also. That is not a problem because in a cannulation, you are using the operative seat. It's not a resectoscope which needs more of dilatation for that. So here, in seven millimeter, you can use it for that. Uh, the operative seat, the, the same thing, but you have to counsel it before. What we do in a diagnostic uh, hysteroscopy and uh, uh, laparoscopy, DHL. There are some cases we suspect we we uh, counsel before end that the operative procedure is necessary. So that she has to be uh, stayed overnight for that. So at least uh, um, cost factor and the duration, all these has to be counseled for that. So those are the cases, concomitant therapeutic procedure can be adopted. There's no problem in doing that. Uh, if you're doing it the same procedure, you can do the procedure and uh, um, the cannula uh, with the operative seed uh, can be very well negotiated with the same sitting for that. The second part of his query is that if perforation occurred during any procedure, then when to do the second sitting? Any specific precautions in second sitting? Now, suppose there is a perforation and you find that uh, um, your investigations is incomplete. You are not able to do the tests. Uh, the right test in a diagnostic or uh, the you are doing a procedure of septum when there is a perforation and all that. Normally what happens in a, in a septum, the perforation is more likely to occur at the end of the procedure and uh, provided it's not there with the dilator. If it is with the dilator, it is in the beginning of the procedure where you can see and by the laparoscopy that there is a, there is a rent and you can seal it with that and a minimum period of a gap of about two months, I recommend that eight weeks period is an optimum period for a healing. And uh, then you can do the procedure for that. And the third part of his query is sir, that DH and EB in PMB. So any tips to reduce possible cancer cell spillage transtubule? Yeah, that is a question I think oncologists always say that uh, whether uh, in a post-menopausal bleeding, whether hysteroscopy is to be done or not. Because if there is a um, endometrial carcinoma that will go 
and spill it for that. But ultimately, how do you diagnose? Majority of the cases of postmenopausal bleeding are either you don't find anything senile endometritis, or in a case of hyperplastic endometrium, I find that the polyp is the major thing for that. So once you find uh, that uh, there is a suspicion, only thing I will just uh, recommend that don't uh, do it and uh, for a long time for that. Quicker to finish it, and as soon as the diagnosis is complete, you just stop so that you don't prolong the procedure for uh, longer time for that. So that is the only thing I will recommend. Otherwise, there is not a problem. And I said, there's one more query, which is finally from Dr. Atul from Champa, saying, sir, is there a chance of complication in bipolar NS resectoscope setup with Collins knife or loop? How much the amount of NS can be used in one setup, and what's the current setting? Well, as far as the volume deficit is concerned, the uh, when you are using the normal saline, the all the available data shows that the limit is 2.5 liters. If there is a deficit of 2.5 liters, the chances of pulmonary edema is more. And uh, uh, if uh, you are using the um, glycine, uh, 500 ml, you must cost us. 750 ml must be very, very cautious. 1000 ml, you abandon the procedure. So I would recommend that, yes, uh, 1500 ml of normal saline. I think that is important. And it is not the amount of normal saline. It is the duration which is important. How within a short time, if 1500 ml also goes behind, it goes right to pulmonary edema for that. So that is the purpose for which don't think that by doing a bipolar setup, you are completely safe. That is my thing and all that. I have I have also found uh, many cases of pulmonary edema because of the bipolar. The only thing is that it is not that fatal as compared to glycine hyponatremia or ammonia toxicity, where it is absolutely fatal. But here it is a treatable. But be cautious about that. The timing is important. The pathology is important. If you are going for the myoma resection is more common, but uh, it's not for uh, the septum takes a long, uh, short time and this is a fibrous thing and all that. The myoma becomes vascular, more vessels are there. And uh, that's why, there, there, therefore, I always say, if you're going for a myoma resection, don't do a myoma resection without endomat. Because even with the gravity, even with the conventional uh, thing, which I have demonstrated, cheaper, you do not know how much is being absorbed for that also. And what is the pressure? So therefore, a controlled suction irrigation system like Endomat is much more preferable for that. Dr. Uh, Maya Padi has uh, just commented that uh, excellent presentation, simple, lucid, and lovely visuals. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, Dr. Poonam Gupta from Varanasi, she is asking for uh, you to provide your uh, phone number if possible. Just note down 99374-96591. 99374-96591. Want right. to talk to me? Good. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you very much. Right, sir. Thank you so much for your presence, sir. And it was really a lovely, lovely uh, session. And we all enjoyed it thoroughly, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.